how to invent a religion. I always knew you had to be willing to die to even do this job. You can't stop what to come. Executive orders. The creation and the maintenance of a secret government within our government. Is something wrong? The what? With anything. I feel like you won't stand right to rip your face off. There's something wrong with everything. I was so spun. What's the most you ever lost in the coin toss? The law of the jungle. Sir. The most you ever lost in the coin toss. You don't know what you're talking about. Something about it, All right, Internet citizens, you know what time it is. Black Ball Rolly Quaid right here on revisionmedia.org. And I got a special guest for you tonight. I got no other than Adam Fitzgerald. Adam, are you there? Good evening, Rolly Quaid. Hey, good to have you on my show, sir. Um, you called in last week, and I thought, right, you know, um, for you to be my guest. Um, you know, um, we've had a couple of private conversations, and I think that you have a lot of information that you could share with us tonight in regards to 9-11. Sure, Will, and thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And um, if you were going to explain to a group of third graders what's your position on 9-11, try to capsulate it for us real quick, um, speaking not too fast, but not too slow, on um, sure. what, what your position is. Well, I am a skeptic. Um, I differ from the the generalities of the truther or debunker groups. Um, I'm not too far off the metal when it comes to either side, but um, my information that uh, I have ascertained over the years is a little bit different from either one. Debunkers generally um, believe in the official account, although they tend to differ. They're not as... Uh, sectarian as the truth movement. The truth movement itself is one entire movement. However, the problem is is that there are many competing uh, sectarian, if I could use the term loosely, uh, groups within each other, but they contradict one another. And I don't pertain to any group. I'm an individual. Skeptics usually are like uh, atheists when it comes to the debate between atheism and religion. Um, trying to herd a bunch of atheists in a room is like trying to herd a bunch of cats. And we are not as uh, uncompromising uh, as skeptics, but there are very few and far between of us. And the reason why I'm a skeptic is that I believe uh, that the information uh, that most people uh, ascertain to, bro, uh, that they believe is generally false. The, the actual anomalies of 9-11 uh, are usually blanketed by those who purport the official account. Well, I want to get into the official account because there's really no such thing as an official account. I don't know where people get this idea that there's an official account from because if you're going to say that the 9-11 Commission uh, had the, an official account, I would say it's an incomplete account. Um, they didn't have, uh, they, well, they investigated a large part of 9-11, but they didn't get into the uh, primary intricate details of 9-11, and I'll bring that up in the show. Um, so I would, I would generally say that I'm a little bit off the mark when it comes to those of the truther or the bulk of movements, um, because there is conspiracy with 9-11. But these conspiracies are blanketed by these fringe uh, beliefs that uh, either are have an agenda behind it or these people are just generally misinformed. And I don't blame the truth movement as a whole. Um, I call them really victims. Uh, it's not their fault. I do blame the proponents of these uh, numerous 
uh, groups or followings is as a number of people that uh, even uh, contradict one another, and they do this. Uh, I mean, uh, you, on your show, they had to, you know, you had Steve Diak and Jim Fetzer uh, posing one another. Um, this is not uh, in agreement with a truth movement because if you had a truth movement, you have one giant unit that can move forward. And the only time that ever happened was in 2001. Um, and they weren't even called truthers. They never called themselves anything. They were just the New Jersey widows. Lori Van Auken, uh, Karen Brightwork, and they forced the State Department to open up an, uh, two congressional inquiries when they didn't want to. But the public was behind them, and they forced them, and they reluctantly agreed, even though they tried to manipulate the, the board by having Henry Kissinger, of all people, and, of course, there was a big outcry, and uh, Philip Zelikow replaced him. Um, a little bit of an upgrade, but still uh, not a good choice. And after the inquiries were finalized, uh, the book was incomplete. If you have the 9-11 Commission report, you'll notice that there's no references. It's uh, at least the Warren Commission had references. The 9-11 Commission is basically uh, trust us. That's what the man said. Um, but there are a few uh, uh, bookmarks and whatnot, but they lead to nowhere. And a lot of the information in the 9-11 Commission report, the final report, is based on the testimonies of people who have been tortured endlessly, uh, most notably Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Ramzi bin Shabib. Ram uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed has been, stated, um, has been stated that he was tortured 174 times uh, by waterboarding, which is unbelievable in a month. And Ramsey bin Shabib was waterboarded 81 times. Um, if you have ever uh, known somebody who has experienced waterboarding, it is a slow drowning. And for Khalid Sheikh Mohammed to even endure 174 sessions is remarkable in its own right. And I have a theory behind that. But uh, we'll get that in the show. But that's basically the gist of it. If you ask me what happened on 9-11... I would um, be honest with you and say, I cannot explain in five to ten minutes. 9-11 is not just about the day itself. It is basically uh, decades, years of a timeline. And who are these people? Who were these hijackers? Who, who, uh, who were these people in the uh, urban moving systems? This is Israeli front. Who was behind the CIA, Alex? And there's a lot. I mean, it, it is a large study. And I think a lot of people may have 9-11 misunderstood in the fact that they think it's basically four airplanes crashed in four areas, and that's it. It was done by religious fundamentalists. That's not the official account. The official account is a little bit more broad. But that's not basically the whole story. There's more to it, and I'll also relate that uh, to you in the show. Absolutely. You touched on a lot of great points. <laughs> I wanted to chime in on so many points that you made, especially like talking about like uh, we can't have a movement unless we're moving towards something or having some sort of objective going on or working in some sort of cohesion with one another. You're absolutely correct when you and you hit the nail on the head with that point, Adam. But um, you touched on waterboarding with Khalil Sheikh Mohammed. Do you think that a lot of his testimony was made just because of the pain of waterboarding itself? Pains of waterboarding. Actually, you know what? Let, let's talk about who he is to begin with, because some of the audience, and you've brought this up before, they don't even know who the guy is. Well, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is the uncle to uh, Ramzi Youssef. And for those who don't know who Ramzi Youssef is, Ramzi Youssef was indicted and a suspect for the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. He is the one who uh, uh, built he, he, the bomb. Um, he, he, the blind Sheikh was actually in prison in the town I was born at. In North oh, is that, is that correct? Yeah. You know, there's a lot of history regarding North Carolina and uh, certain 
uh, suspects within 93 and 2001. But um, we'll talk about that in a private conversation. A little bit about Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Um, he is a, uh, um, a financier. He's uh, also a dissenter. He's basically a loner when it comes to uh, al-Qaeda. He, he doesn't join al-Qaeda until much later. Um, he actually is asked by bin Laden to give bayat, which is Arabic for loyalty, and he refuses at first. Um, but he's basically someone who's connected to organized crime. He's not religious, in, to say the least. He's not pious in any manner. Um, usually these people are pick and choosers, much like uh, people in the Christian faith who are religionists. I call them the uh, the revelationists, the people who don't uh, go by the He tenets. thought about himself as being the Mahdi himself, the blind sheikh. That's partly why he didn't pledge loyalty to Osama bin Laden. A lot of those guys pledged loyalty to Osama bin Laden was just because of the vast wealth. Right. And, well, um, may, may I interfere just for a second? Um, you made go ahead, a... Go ahead. You just made a slight error. Uh, the, the blind sheikh is Omar Abdel Rahman. Uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is the uncle to Ramzi Yusuf. Um, I'm sorry. The blind sheikh lived in my town, and we always referred to him as the blind sheikh only. No, that's and fine. It, yeah, um, but please, please proceed. Yeah, um, well, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is an interesting figure. Not many people know exactly uh, where he's born. Some say Baluchistan, Pakistan. Um, and others say uh, in Afghanistan, same thing with Ramzi Youssef. These are very, uh, very uh, well-to-do people. They're not very sociable, except for womenizing, so to speak. Um, they're born in a town that is uh, basically traditionalistic. If uh, if they were born in Baluchistan, Pakistan, which is a key area point for terrorist activity itself. But um, there's a lot of questions about this individual, where he was born. Um, he, is an, he really is an interesting figure. Regarding the waterboarding point, which is what you uh, positioned earlier, um, my theory is this, and this is basically just a theory. There's no uh, facts behind it. And when you waterboard somebody, you're basically trying to get information out of them. And... After a couple of times, you're going to uh, say the jig is up and I'm just going to, you know, come out clean. I think what happened with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was that they were trying to get him to admit to crimes that he never committed. And he was adamant about it. Now, of course, he's an exaggerator. He does this from time to time. Um, he's also a, uh, a manipulator. Also, he's well-spoken. Um, and he's actually a very good uh, orator. But also, at the same time, he's someone that couldn't really be trusted. So basically, with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, there's a lot of question marks regarding uh, his uh, earlier years, his primary formal years. But I think that's exactly what happened to him. Now, according to um, uh, Francis Ann Bitowski, who is the... Uh, uh, CIA, who was married to Michael Shorey, who was the, at one time the CIA station chief of the Alec Bin Laden issue station. She was present at one of the waterboarding uh, sessions for Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, and her reason for being there was so that she could experience uh, the man being tortured, which says a lot about her in general, and there's a lot of nefarious history regarding her brutality in general. Um, but Khalid Sheikh Mohammed himself is at Guantanamo Bay, and so is uh, Ramzi bin Shabib, uh, Will, while bin Atash, is, his nickname is Khalad, and a couple of others, Ali Abdul Aziz Ali, and about three others. And they're currently waiting trial. Now, this is where it gets a bit sketchy. Um, the trial itself is basically based on the evidence by the testimony of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Ramzi bin Shabib. The prosecutors are delaying the trial for good reason. There's a good reason why the trial is in a military tribunal, because uh, civil law here in the United States doesn't apply, where there's a trial date um, and there's a limited amount of time that you can pause a trial. Here, they're just waiting for them to die. That's what I believe. And I think that's the general consensus of those who are learned about the event, 
believe as well. And that's what the defense lawyers for Khalid Sheikh Mohammed believe as well. Came right out, I think, two weeks ago in the Washington Post and said, I, I believe that they're waiting for my clients to die because he's salivating at the issue uh, for this to go to trial because it'll, be, it'll get thrown out of court because all of the information that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed admitted to was under duress, torture. And the, um, the reason uh, for the torture uh, is what I explained before. I think it was to get them to, to admit to the crimes that they didn't commit. Now, there is a laundry list of crimes that he uh, admitted to. And when I saw the list, I immediately said, it, it, now it makes sense for me, the reason why they tortured him so much. Because you had this guy um, pleading guilty to everything under the sun. Now, does that mean that he's uh, an innocent individual and he's uh, someone who has a moral background? No, this guy is a, a criminal. He's an, I think he's an organized criminal. And he's a terrorist, but not for the religious fundamental reasons. Um, and like I said before, there's plenty of uh, mysterious uh, happenstance regarding him. And it goes all the way back to the Pacheco plot. And I'll just briefly mention what the Pacheco plot was. The Pacheco plot is actually a, an operation that didn't come to fruition, thankfully. Uh, regarding the plantation of 12, uh, 11 timing devices on 11 planes traveling from Southeast Asia to the United States and have them all blown up over the Pacific while they were in midair, uh, one minute apart from each other. And the reason why they chose the Pacific was that so the evidence would sink to the bottom of the sea and they wouldn't know what happened. It was an ingenious plot. It was a remarkable plot. And according to... Um, history itself, and there's a lot of information to go with that this operation was headed by Ramzi bin Shabi, um, I'm sorry, Ramzi Youssef, and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, but they weren't the only ones. Um, another fellow who was involved in the operation, who actually funneled money to these two individuals, was Jamal bin Khalifa, who is the brother-in-law to Osama bin Laden. A lot of history behind him. He was recently killed in a night raid uh, he was butchered, actually, by swords and knives by about uh, 30 people who were dressed in black. Uh, no one really knows the reason for it, but he was uh, basically assassinated. Um, but there's, and that's where 9-11 was uh, constructed from, not from Operation Northwood, which is a, a general mistake. It's a you know, well-to-do mistake. It's not uh, anything that... Um, uh, it's, it's easily explainable because Pachinko plot is not known by everybody. It's often a forgotten piece of history, but it's a very key piece because it goes to show you that um, what these people are capable of doing. But it also goes to show you that the intelligence apparatus, um, basically the State Department, where Condoleezza Rice went before the 9-11 Commission and basically perjured herself when she said the following, um, and I'll do my best to quote, uh, we had no ideas that they would use planes as weapons. And that's not true, because in 1995, um, when they uh, interviewed one of the uh, Bajika plot conspirators, his name was Abdul Hakim Arad, he even stated that uh, they had a second a phase of that operation, and that operation was to slam planes into high-value targets, the very first target ever mentioned about having a plane dived in the building was Langley CIA headquarters. So this information, which was gathered by the Philippine National Police and the lead investigator, Rodolfo Mendoza, was forwarded to the FBI in 95. That's six years prior to 9-11. He states, and you can find his interview on Associated Press, um, he basically says that they got the information and did nothing with it. He never got a follow-up. Nothing was done. Abdul Hakim Murad was found guilty. He was given uh, 160 years, and so was Ramzi Yusuf for the 1993 bombing and for the Bajinka plot. But what I'm trying to tell you is, is that 9-11 has a history. And if you go back in time far enough, even before the Bajinka plot, you'll see pieces start to fall. And I always go by 
um, the 1979 Afghan war, the Afghan-Soviet war. And why I choose that uh, point in time is because when you, you, you can actually see the beginning stages of this new uh, revival of this uh, defensive jihad, as they put it, uh, this new revelation of religious fundamentalism, it's not just about religious fundamentalism. That was the beginning tenets of it. But it grew much more insidious uh, after that because the CIA and Pakistan ISI and the British MI6, the Israeli Mossad, and a lot of the, the Saudi GID, the General Intelligence Directorate, um, all had their hands in basically creating this, uh, so to speak, Frankenstein monster at first and then had the nerve to call them freedom fighters, were there anything but? Um, in the beginning stages of the 1979 war, yes, you had Pashtun farmers, um, you had Afghani nationals who actually fought for the country, but they were getting killed, and Pakistan itself was replacing them um, with this new ideology called defensive jihad, which was pur purported by uh, a Palestinian imam called Abdullah Azam. Um, who started teaching at uh, in Jalalabad um, through many of these madrasas. And he was a popular figure, and it caught on because it gave them a sense of going back to the, the tenets of early Islam rather than fighting for a nationalist point of view. Um, but I don't want to lose your, your uh, listeners, um, so if you have any questions regarding uh, your, the previous points I mentioned, please do so. Yeah, actually, let's talk about KSM, and then we'll go to uh, back to Azam. Is that okay? By all means. Uh, okay. Um, did you know that he was actually a graduate, and I'm referring to KSM, of a historical black college in North Carolina called A&T back in yeah. the 1980s? Yes, I, I'm fully aware of that, yes. And I don't know if you know the culture in North Carolina, like, um, black people in general tend to be like highly suspicious of Arabs, mm -hmm. like even more so than white folks. And like, I, I'm just curious, like what the culture would have been like for them, you know, in this whole like isolation process, because um, a lot of these guys, you know, um, that became terrorists, you know, or joined Al Qaeda or made their own groups like uh, Jihad group, which was the blind shades group. There was a sense of isolation, like, um, the same sort of isolation that somebody who's mixed, I don't know if I'm black or I'm white. And these guys, you know, scream to the heavens, am I a Muslim or do I live in a Western country? So they've lost that sense of identity. Is that kind of what, like, um, researchers and psychologists pinpoint, you know, exactly? I mean, they call themselves the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, that sense of belonging. Is, is that part of, like, why somebody would want to join like Al-Qaeda? Um, first of all, I think this is a fantastic point that you brought up, and it's very key, and I'm glad you brought it up. To relate further on it, um, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was actually picked on, and he actually had a very small clique at the uh, university itself. Um, a lot of people were very uh, generally ignorant about Islam itself. Um, usually when they went to uh, their Friday prayers, it was said that students would wait outside and uh, throw their shoes in the, the, the lake nearby where the mosque was. Um, and this became a generally uh, daily occurrence that they were getting picked on. And actually, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was a very reserved individual uh, during his uh, mid-20s. He wasn't overtly religious, um, even though, uh, you know, I don't know what his... Uh, like I said before, his formative years, is, it's so much mystery behind it, not many people know, but um, through uh, more learned uh, researchers like uh, forensic psychologist uh, Gerald Post, who is a fantastic uh, researcher regarding the uh, psychology and the biographical nature of certain uh, religious fundamentalists like a Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, uh, Ramzi Youssef, a, uh, um, uh, Abu Zarqawi, who was the, uh, the leader of ISIS at one point. Um, there is a starting point, and it goes back to all the, all the way back to Saeed Kutub, who is the, the, considered the, the godfather of 
uh, modern day uh, Salafist Wahhabi Islam. It's uh, the same tenets, but he actually uh, evolved uh, Wahhabism to Salafism. Saeed Kutub went to the United States, and he was basically not a religious person. He was actually um, a very well-educated man, um, came into the United States, stood uh, for a couple of months, returned, and was in shock at what he saw um, regarding how the United States would be very wasteful. For example, uh, people would, uh, he found it to be a problem when people watered their, uh, their lawn. He thought it was a waste of water. Um, he actually saw boxing as a, uh, a more primitive form of violence uh, that was unnecessary. Um, and women were allowed to uh, um, become independent um, and form their own opinions. Um, and this basically gave him uh, this new foundation to uh, become very critical of American policies because they themselves, the, the United States, was highly critical of certain uh, Middle East policies, even though at that time they were just beginning to form a relationship with Saudi Arabia. Um, but they were generally ignorant regarding Middle East uh, uh, affairs in general. So there is a link between certain individuals who have grown this uh, ferment or distrust or uh, just outright dislike for American policies. Um, and with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, it was because he got picked on because of his uh, religion, because of his race. And yes, it does ferment. Yes, it does cause a psychological uh, disposition. And especially at uh, his, um, his age of 26, because he actually returned to uh, Afghanistan and Qatar and related uh, his displeasure at how he was being treated. And this, uh, I mean, he took it almost to the extent where um, he became very prejudicial of the United States. And then when uh, the United States uh, started uh, uh, their Iraqi um, um, economic uh, sanctions in 1990, that was a great point in time for a lot of these people, for like Osama bin Laden, for Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, because they saw this as an aggression toward uh, the Muslim faith. And that's all you needed for these, uh, you know, fundamentalists, as so to speak, these religious fundamentalists, that any reason uh, to attack the faith was an affront to them. But according to these, um, I, I don't call them religious fundamentalists, I call them organized crime gangsters. That's what bin Laden was. And that's what Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was. Did they use the religion for their own uh, agendas? Yes, they did. But if you ask any Sunni theologian, um, they'll tell you that they, they don't know anything really about the Quran because most of what they learned was through the Hadith. And the Hadith is just basically the poems or the diaries of um, the Prophet Muhammad. And it was through the Hadith uh, that you saw these influence of religious fundamentalism, which was a, a direct uh, affront to the uh, moral uh, uh, statements made in the Quran. And that was through Ibn Tamiya, uh, Ibn Hanbali. These are religious schools of thought. These are people who added to the Hadiths, who added uh, a more of a aggressive tone of voice, so to speak, towards so, so non-believers. Uh, collectors of hadith itself um you got like three generations of um the followers of islam you have the first three generations i should say it's like the salafi um the tabiyun and the tabiyin is that correct or it's like um and within those three schools um the four major methabs uh or you know collectors of hadith went and searched and they went to various lands of people who knew who knew somebody who was uh, a follower of Muhammad. Is that correct? Is that kind of, you know, like collecting um, raw data and like building a like ideology based on it. Um, and, and they got like different schools of thought. Like if you're bleeding while praying, you know, um, for an example, 
you know, one scholar would say you'd have to immediately stop praying. And uh, I, I think what happened was like, uh, and especially with Wahhabism, which we'll get to now, there was like a melting of all that together. And that kind of opened the way for somebody who's religiously illiterate, like you just said, to kind of make their own interpretation of everything with not going through the whole process of those four hadith collectors. Is that correct? Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with uh, your general statement regarding the historicity of Wahhabism and the, the schools of thought uh, following it. Uh, I would say, though, that um, you can actually see the evolution of the, uh, the godfather of Wahhabism, which is named after Ibn Abdul Wahhab, uh, Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab who is the founder of, modern, of Wahhabism, which actually evolved to uh, Salafism. Actually, if you uh, ha ever have a dialogue with someone of the Salafist nature, they uh, don't like the term Wahhabi because generally Wahhabi had a negative connotation because uh, to give a brief history, to, I, I don't want to... Uh, that was on. actually the name of Allah too, Wahhab, right? It's like the all right, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Now, and we got to we got to bring it back. We got to tell him that um, when he lived to he lived in the 18th century. Is that correct? Yeah, 17th century. Um, he actually lived uh, in I, I believe it was Najaf. I don't hold me to it. Um, it, was it, was desert, it was a desert wasteland called Najad, and there's some okay. sort of hadith that predicted that the Dajjal or the Antichrist right. would come from that region as well. Yeah, actually, he actually, uh, it, there's an interesting story uh, regarding the similarities between uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed bin, uh, bin Laden and himself, is that his ideology changed, uh, Mohammed bin Wahhab, when one day he went on pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia and saw uh, visitors, uh, disbelievers, or the polytheists, actually uh, touching the Kaaba. And he saw this as an affront, and he also saw... Um, people worshiping at the, uh, the the graves, and he saw this as a, a, a total affront to the uh, the schools of thought of Ibn Tamiya and Ibn Hanbali. So he went back in his home, and he basically took uh, the hadiths themselves and manipulated them to where the the tenets of the Quran were to be abrogated, uh, and he saw. Um, these uh, outsiders, so to speak, those of not the schools of thought of, of Ibn Hanbali or Tami or uh, Iwan Kwathalim. And his fa even Muhammad Abdul's father saw this, and he says to his son that uh, you're deviating from the true nature of the Prophet Muhammad. And he actually threw him out of his house. And he actually wandered the desert. He actually got a few followers. And... Um, Basically, ran into uh, the uh, the first crowd of uh, Abu uh, Abu Fah, and together they created uh, what was now called Saudi Arabia, but it was called um, and forgive me for my forgetful nature. Um, it was called the Emirate of Daria, and together with um, Abu Sa uh, Abu da Saud, um, he. Uh, stated that you are in uh, this is a Wahhab talking he tells Saud you're in charge of political matters I'll be in charge of religious matters and that tenant that beginning those primary tenants still resonate today because Saudi Arabia is governed by two entities one the religious sector and two the the families the seven families are called the Sudari seven it's the seven lines of the father um and there are seven families regarding the issue now these people are not primarily religious uh saudi arabia has a unique uh disposition usually the religious sector is at odds with the family because they consider them too western um and they consider them not truly a religious state even though saudi arabia is really a religious state um, they are they are the most religious entity on the face of the earth, and they are governed, uh, Lord, by uh, the scripture. Now, as of recent, through Mohammed bin Salman, the the um, the the Crown Prince, 
he actually abolished uh, the religious police and for the first time in 40 years allowed movie houses to open um, to see how long this lasts. Um, we'll see. With the, uh, I, I know that he's losing um, favor within the older traditional uh, lines, uh, the uh, first, the family line, and the religious sector don't care for him much either because he actually um, doesn't, he's not really a religiously inclined person, um, even though he does some very uh, brutal things. I mean, every Wednesday, they uh, behead somebody at Riyadh Square um, because they they're either which they're either practicing witchcraft or homosexuality, and um, you know it's just ridiculous. I think the other just uh, recently they they killed thirty four people, behead them all, and um, one of them was a um, a uh, engineer. Uh, so yes, I mean they'll kill their own, um, but um, going as far back as uh, the early tenets of Wahhabism. And why we're talking about it, because it's very key. And there's a lot of things that one has to do in order to get a better understanding of 9-11. And I basically put it out like this. uh, To have an understanding of Middle East affairs and their culture, um, religious fundamentalism, the intelligence agencies, uh, the uh, U.S.-Middle East uh, relationship, especially Saudi Arabia, the United States, and the Foreign Lobby Institute. And there's a couple of institutes, but two very important ones. The Israeli Foreign Lobby, which is the largest foreign lobby in the, in the United States. And the second largest foreign lobby, which a lot of people don't realize, is the Saudi lobby. And the reason why is because Saudis don't have an annual conference like Israel does. Israel has the uh, APAC conference. And the APAC conference is... Uh, if you want, I'll just give a brief explanation. I don't want to deviate from your your, your questions or your points. Uh, APAC is basically a um, Zionist organization. They cater to Israeli policies only, even though that they are residing inside the United States. They have um, they require the attendance of the the Senate and the House, both Democrats and Republicans, and they all go. Because when they announce the names of people that go, they, it's almost like a, uh, the Academy Award, so to speak, when you go inside. They have these large screens, and they're you know, almost like, uh, I, I, I could say like drive-in screens. I mean, or if you go to like a, a drive-in movie, huge screens, and they, they show you the face of the, the politicians that are coming in their background. And it's basically to say, hey, look who supports us. And if you're not on that list, uh, God forbid you won't you won't primarily be kicked out of office, but what they'll do is they won't um, the word will get out, and people like um, Harvard uh, Premier Chair Alan Dershowitz, who's like a bar a, a, a bark dog for uh, the Likud Party or the, the these rigid Zionists, um, they'll send an email out and they'll basically say, hey, this guy is no good. Um, don't uh, fund his uh, upcoming campaign or his re-election, or maybe he won't get uh, a necessary funding for a bill or a piece of legislature. If he goes before the House or the Senate, he'll be basically dismissed, um, uh, and, and everyone will know it. Um, and this is basically a force, uh, almost a show of force for the Israeli uh, Likud party. And there's a difference between the Likud and, uh, you know, the, the, the labor parties or the green parties or the, the Shahs, which are uh, other dissenting parties that have a more, well, the Shahs are religious, but the, the labor of the greens um, are more liberal oriented. Um, but the, 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 the Likud party has a very good stranglehold. And I thought with the past election that they had, it was the only time where I saw the Likud party really threatened. And the the the, uh, the opposing party actually just gave up, even though he could have waited for like a count, but he didn't. And I wonder if there was some sort of pressure um, to maybe resign at the uh, the point of trying to keep it going. I don't know. That's speculation on my point, and I don't like to speculate. But going back to the influence of the APAC organization itself, it's detrimental 
because it only caters to Israeli policies, not the American uh, point of view. And it basically forces these politicians to enact laws or legislature in favor of Israel itself. And I'm not basically putting blame on Israel itself. Um, That's to generalize the country. And there are people within the Israeli state that oppose uh, the the Likud party or the the extremist uh, form of Zionism. And even though I don't agree with these Orthodox Jews themselves, the uh, Haredi, the the real religious people, uh, they're the only ones who are vocal about the Zionists themselves. You won't see anybody um, have uh, an organization or have a movement regarding them because they're basically shut down right away. And that's a very ingenious part regarding Israeli policy that they immediately go for the attack, almost like uh, Scientology does. When someone's very critical, they send, you know, these private investigators and they go on the attack. And what they do is you have these small Zionist organizations like the Zionist Organizations of America, Christians, uh, uh, Jews, uh, Christians for Jews, um, and these uh, other smaller organizations that are basically there to uh, view or to monitor American opinions about Israel itself. And if they see any type of movement or organization, they're quelled right away. Um, But it's not uh, a slight on Israel itself. And I want people to understand that because a lot of people basically just blame Israel for the attacks of 9-11, and they're being very disingenuous. And they ba- and you also have people on the debunker point of view who basically just uh, blame Muslims uh, for 9-11. That's not basically true. They're not wrong, but it's uh, erroneous at best. I don't want to say that they're disingenuous because that's a, a, a general charge, and I don't like doing that. Um, but I think a lot of people within the truth movement uh, itself, because it's a bigger movement. Um, I think the primary problem stems from the fact of these two points. One is a disposition psychologically in research. I think a lot of people, this is just from my point of view, from my experience in uh, talking with truthers, interacting with them in the three years I've been on uh, Facebook and the internet, um, And I see this almost repetitive problem of people, when I ask them to explain further, what what do they think happened at a a specific uh, point in in 9-11? And I'll get this general uh, response. They'll actually post in response a video, and it'll be a lecture, or it'll be a documentary, and it'll be two hours. And it's basically what I call piggybacking. These people that do this are basically people who don't do proper research. If they do, it's very basic. And they'll they'll research only worldviews that they agree with. And this is not an affront on just truthers. I see this with debunkers as well, but it's not uh, as a, um, a broader problem as with truthers. And there is a reason why for this. It's because the truth movement itself is the movement that is opposing the, um, the, or trying to get a new inquiry into 9-11. They're the ones who created the 9-11 Commission, the Joint House Inquiry for the 9-11 attacks, even though the irony was that they weren't truthers. And so in 2002, the very first conspiracy came out, and it was called uh, Le Pentgate, and it was authored by Thierry Mason who is a French author. And basically, the book, uh, the premise is that Thierry Mason saw two photos of the Pentagon. And one photo was a a window on the second floor and the the fire retardant, which was blocking the bottom view. And he thought that um, a plane could fit in that hole. But what he didn't see was the damage to the bottom. And he ran with it. He actually said that, Um, a a missile hit the Pentagon and that there's no video showing a plane hit the Pentagon. And that's disingenuous, even though that there's two security videos, uh, it doesn't show a plane because the plane was going at 
at a high rate of speed. It's not a continuous uh, camera, uh, a CCT camera, and it wasn't going to capture a plane. Uh, and regardless of the fact, he made the book. And it was a couple of years later where it didn't catch on. But by 2006, you had David Ray Griffin, uh, Dave Von Cleese, who co-produced a documentary called In Plain Sight, Alex Jones, Jim Fetzer, the old time uh, conspiracy theorists. Um, and Didn't these a lot people, of those guys leave off the intelligence agency that was broken up. I mean, the like largest ring of 200 men were broken up during 9 11. They were all Israeli. What do you know about that? Yeah, well, that's well, um, there's two. A lot of people get this mixed up. There was two instances where there was a, a investigation regarding uh, Israeli spies in the United States. One was the AMDOT investigation, which was after 9-11, and that was reported by, of all stations, Fox News. Um, and Carl Cameron was uh, uh, the uh, reporter uh, of the story, and he was uh, almost, in a way, told not to run with the story because it was a, I believe it was a 10-part series, don't get me wrong, I could be wrong about the number, but only there's three. four that I know about. But if there, yeah. was, I think there were. I, I think you're right. I think there was other series going to come out. Yeah, it was a huge. That. It was right. I don't mean to interrupt, uh, but um, yeah, it was a huge investigation, even bigger than uh, Irving Moving Systems, which was just the uh, the spy intelligence agency um, of the Mossad that were tracking the uh, the uh, um, uh, Al Qaeda operatives in the United States. And these are two separate investigations. And the key, I, to me, the key is understanding which one was involved. Now, also, too, at the same time, while the, uh, the Israeli Mossad was working in moving agencies, uh, which was uh, an ingenious idea because they actually were following the hijackers as they were moving. And in one instance, they actually moved the hijacker from Hollywood, Florida to uh, New Jersey. Uh, more on that in a bit. But um, at, while this was going on, you had Israelis posing as art students. And this was a much bigger ring uh, regarding the movers. And these were people that were infiltrating where they were selling art. And they were selling art to basically people affiliated with the State Department, uh, the Drug Enforcement Agency, and the FBI. Now, this is key. Um, now, this is also a reach. I don't have evidence for this, but it's it's very uh, it's it's historically inclined that when you do a black operation, uh, I'll use the example of the CIA. The CIA can't go before, say, the Senate House Committee and ask for thirty five million dollars to the fund the Mujahideen. Okay, it's a because they can't. First of all, they can't operate in the United States. And they can only do black operations uh, outside the United States. So they can't go, they can't just ask the Senate for money. They can't go and uh, co call for a coup of like Egypt, which they did, and ask for money. So where do they get the money from? Well, uh, the drug trade, and which is the, one of the reasons why they're in Afghanistan and in uh, the Kandahar province, which is the largest. Uh, area on earth for poppy fields. Um, regarding that, I think what was happening here now, don't hold me to it. And, you know, a key thing I want to make sure to, for every listener here is whatever I'm saying today, previous and going forward, I don't want you to believe me. And I want you to write down what I'm saying today. And whether I'm making a previous statement or whether, whether or I'm going to make a statement in the future. I want you to do your own research. I want you to take what I say and then you look for yourself because that was one of the, uh, the problems I was going to uh, reiterate with the truth movement is that they basically just uh, assume and they generally uh, make the mistake of going with the research itself and trusting that person. Don't do that. Um, and do that, don't do that with me. Um, going back to the point of the Israeli art students, I think what they were doing was 
they were selling drugs inside the United States to fund uh, their operations inside the United States. Because remember now, uh, they were conducting uh, uh, spying on these operatives and not uh, informing the FBI. In other words, they were illegally inside the United States spying. And I'll reiterate in a bit, I'll relate in a bit regarding this um, Israeli art students. Now, generally, truthers make this mistake, and it's through the, the research of Rebecca Roth, who I won't even mention again. She claims that the art students were actually people um, putting plastics inside the, the World Trade Center. This is, this is a mistake. Those people that were doing that um, art show that was uh, a year prior, um, they're called the um, Gelatin B. Uh, Gelatin B. Gelatin B are not even Israeli. They're Austrian. And they are an art, uh, art student, even though I think what they did was, you know, really strange. And they even have a book on Amazon. If you can get it, it's $600. And it's a really good piece of history. Um, but yeah, get it. There's nothing nefarious about them. And Rebecca, I'll, I'm being hypocritical. She likes to bring up the point that the boxes that you see in one picture that they put in the book is uh, BB-8. I think it was called BB-88 uh, was the name of the uh, the name of the box. If you do a little bit of digging, you'll find out that those boxes belong to a company called Littlefield, and they're an electronics company. And BB-88 uh, is actually a, um, a fuse. It's a, a strip of fuses for electronics. They were working inside those empty spaces inside. They were doing electrical construct. And basically, the, the World Trade Center uh, was, didn't have many uh, offices uh, filled because they were going through uh, the, the, the construction field. They, they were economically deprived. Um, and Larry Silverstein himself was actually... Uh, having a group of people go out and try to get people to move inside uh, the World Trade Center. So, yeah, I mean, they were reconstructing certain parts of the floor. Now, this is very important because when you make these conspiratorial claims and they're false, the people on the debunker side or the people on the fence, so to speak, they're going to generally say, look at how these people think. They're irresponsible because not every truth that thinks this way. And you have to wonder the agenda of, like, a Rebecca Roth or a Jim Fetzer or a David Ray Griffin. And I'm not going to say that they work for any agency and they're doing this on purpose. I happen to believe that a lot of these people do it to sell books, uh, to remain relevant, to remain popular. Some of these people really genuinely believe in what they're saying. But they're not actual researchers. They're not someone who opposes uh, their biases, who, who, who disseminates or uh, puts away their prejudices, whether it be religious reasons, political reasons, anti-Jew, anti-Muslim, whatever. But if you have a certain prejudice about yourself and it's in the back of your head, you're only going to look at evidence that agrees with you. And I made this mistake a long time ago when I studied theology in 2002. I was, I was already, I was an atheist, but I became an anti-theist because I followed the works of Christopher, Hedge, uh, Christopher Hitchens, um, Richard Dawkins, St. Harris. It wasn't until around 2005 that I realized the mistake I made. And I became every bit like the people I hated, which were the overt religious people, the people who actually used religion or used the, the faith for their goals. And they weren't religious. And that was basically the, the evangelical Christians I was opposing and uh, those of the far-right uh, Islamic extremists. And from there, I swore to myself that I would never make that mistake again, that I had to change myself, my worldview, and eliminate these divisive properties like racism, uh, politics, and religion. And when I say religion, I'm not saying... Uh, uh, that, that there's no difference between like religion and say spirituality. Don't believe in God. I'm not saying that, but there are certain divisive uh, tautologies taught in these, and they're all unnatural. And what I'm trying to say is they all learn it. You're not born religious. You're not born racist. And you're not born of a political affiliation. These are all human institutions. 
and they all have one common theme. They're divisive. And if you are uh, like a Republican Christian or you're a, Mo a Muslim and you're liberal or you're a Jew and you're right wing, if you go into any history, you don't have to go into 9-11. If you go into any history and you research it and you make this mistake of only listening to your worldview, you are doing yourself a disservice. And the way to correct this issue is to be honest with yourself first. And the way to do that is to either listen to both sides and find out which one is promoting the factual uh, truth about whatever they're talking about. And if that's the case, you have to reposition um, your previous inquiries and then make the correction. And that's what a lot of these people, these proponents, don't do in the truth movement, as well as the debunkers. But I tend to, to uh, not blame them as much because they're not as uh, large of a movement. And I, I, I pick on the truth movement because I want them to actually clean house, so to speak. I want them to get rid of these people. And you know, I'm, I'm a pessimist. I don't think that's ever going to happen. And I think the truth movement's compromised to the extent where a reversal is almost an, an implausibility at this point. But if you're an optimist, which I'd rather have you know, yourself or the listener to be, you want to make that change. And there's going to be a lot Adam, of people. Yeah, go on. We're, we're moving on to um, the second hour. Do you need to take a break or do you want to skip the break? No, no, I'm fine. I'm not fine. And not to, uh, also a, a quick, quick point about the Israeli art students was that they were infiltrating uh, these uh, DTA and the FBI in monitoring uh, uh, what was being uh, accumulated by them and what was accumulated by the DA because behind that, the Israeli also were buying a huge, uh, a huge operation in New York, which was the ecstasy trade. And there's a huge history behind that, but I'll, I'll leave that for now. But there's a, there's a lot of uh, um, intricate details regarding the Israeli spies inside the United States. But go on to your... To yeah, your, you're, um, you're absolutely right. They made a movie um, called Holy Roller um, that talks about actually Hasidic Jews... Um, making and selling ecstasy and it's perfect if you've ever been to gregorian airport i mean it's so full of ascetic jews yeah. and they're traveling back into forth back into forth you would be hard pressed to find somebody who wasn't a dreadlocked weirdo look you yeah. know dressed up like uh somebody's amish you know in those particular yeah. airports they get around you know and um they all look alike it's hard to profile them too because if you look like a drone, <laughs> you can't distinguish, um, you know, Abe from uh, um, Habib or whatever. I, I don't know what Jewish names. Habib is more of a Palestinian slang. But um, let's get into a little bit, and you've already touched about it, Irving Moving Systems. And I know that you're indifferent to controlled demolition, and you like to say you don't like to get into the physics of it all. What do you think about that particular van that was pulled over going to the hall and um, tunnel? If it, and uh, there was evidence of bomb making material inside that. Wouldn't that be a perfect opportunity uh, for the urban movement systems to actually plant charges inside um, the World Trade Center one, two, and seven? Well, a little bit about this. There's also a misconception regarding this story. Uh, it was reported by uh, Monica Kramer of NBC and uh, um, Tom Brokaw um, that there was a van that was there was a truck that was uh, pulled over by the George Washington Bridge, and that this report came from the ground uh, and was reiterated to a reporter, and then that reporter went back and reported to. Uh, Brokaw and uh, Kramer. It was reported that the truck was packed with explosives. Now, the now Kramer actually reported this. I think three times during the day. Brokaw twice. I, I'm sorry. I, I don't think it was Brokaw. It was um, Dan Rather. I, I'm sorry. It was Dan Rather. And they were the only reporters that were reporting this. Now, during the evening, Rather actually says uh, that he had unconfirmed reports regarding it on the follow-up. And he actually states 
not give him a little bit of credit for it, whether whether it was true or not, we're just going by the reports of the day, and there's a lot of confusion because there were tens of thousands of calls. I mean, they were flooding the NYPD with uh, you know uh, numerous of uh, things that were that were not even happening. This is very important because that story is always mixed up with the urban moving systems van that was pulled over at the New Jersey Turnpike. And I'll explain. The, the New Jersey Turnpike van was actually seen in the morning by a Maria, by a neighbor called Maria at a place called Doric Towers, which was a high rise in, in New Jersey. Uh, urban moving systems uh, had a, a contract early in the day and they were, go, they were going to this high rise. However, the contract was canceled, and supposedly they stood there. But that doesn't explain uh, that they had the camera ready and they were filming. Now, according to, I believe it was the Easy Pass that they were using, um, they entered New Jersey at like eight. I think it was eight. Don't quote me on this. I, I'm going to get the time wrong. But it was somewhere between eight thirty to eight forty-five. And if that's the case, they couldn't get to Doric Towers until after the first plane hit. So I'm going to say that they were there when the first plane hit. But they make a mistake here because when they're arrested at the New Jersey Turnpike, and there were only three of them at Doric Towers, five of them get arrested at the New Jersey Turnpike, they make the mistake because they, they lie when they're, when they're brought back to one police plaza. Every, all of them lie. They all fail the lie detector tests. And it wasn't until when they interviewed um, uh, uh, Omar Mamamri, uh, I'm butchering his last name, Omar Mamamri, um, he's uh, the youngest of the group, and he basically cries and breaks down. And he tells them that, yeah, he, he, he lies about certain issues regarding what they were doing during the day. Um, also, what makes this quite perplexing is when they were pulled over by, I believe that the officer's name was Scott DiCarlo, um, part of the New Jersey uh, police. Immediately, uh, the driver was Sivan Kersberg. He has a brother, Paul Kersberg, in the truck. Immediately getting out of the truck. I mean, they had to pull him out because he didn't want to get out. Um, immediately when he gets pulled out, he actually states, and I'll quote, we are not your problem. The Palestinians are your problem. Your problems are our problems. The reason why I'm bringing this up, because early during the day of 9-11, um, when the towers were hit, there was a phone call to the NYPD, and it was made through a payphone. I don't know where, and this was a an issue that wasn't really investigated. But it also gave a little bit of a hint at where the direction was going right away. And the caller basically said uh, to the NYPD um, uh, uh, officer online, uh, the operator, he says, uh, "There's a truck driving around." And it's filled with Arabs. They're Palestinians. They're dressed as, oh, no, I'm sorry. There's a truck going around. It's a white truck. And they have a mural on the, on the side of it of a plane diving into the World Trade Center. And it, they're being driven by Palestinians. Now, what this caller is applying is that he could tell what a Palestinian looks like. And that's ridiculous um, in its own right. But it, it, it's actually purporting a narrative of where this is going and um, what they, who they wanted to blame. And it wasn't just Bin Laden and it wasn't just uh, Al-Qaeda. It was a mention of Palestine. Because why else would Asylum Kurzberg say that? And that's pretty weird in its own right. It's very unique. It's very troubling. And even Scott DeCarlo says in an interview, I forgot who interviewed him, but even he says that he found it to be quite odd. And to further uh, imp uh, apply on this point, also, the New Jersey uh, Turnpike uh, report itself is redacted. And you could find the report in its uh, entirety on archive.org, which is a great uh, uh, website to look at uh, documents and files and that you can't get online. Um, and it is basically the, the entire report is almost entirely redacted. And... Look, if, if, you're, if you're saying that these were just Israeli movers, they, yeah, they, they were Mossad, and because all males are, are brought up in the military, and yeah, they were spying, um, 
why the need to, re to redact the report if they're, they're innocent. Immediately after they were arrested, the manager of uh, Irving Movie Systems, Dominic Suter, um, was questioned by the FBI. And when they called him for a second interview, he fled the country, leaving behind the entire company, leaving behind uh, 200 phone calls on his phone, all basically from people whose furniture was never delivered. And 2020 did a, uh, a report regarding urban moving systems, and they were the only ones to do it. And that's why I, I particularly enjoy John Miller. Um, he investigated the issue and stated the anomaly regarding urban moving systems, um, why they left, and that they wanted to interview Dominic Suter. And Suter said, when I return from Israel, I'm going to write a book and do interviews. And he's inside the United States. And he's been in the, in the United States for, I think, the past seven, eight years. And um, nothing. Not a thing. A drop of the bucket. You don't hear anything from him. And Irving Moving Systems uh, itself is not just basically based in New Jersey. They're based in New York. Um, and also, they were uh, pulled over in Pennsylvania. And this is a very important issue because it's hardly ever brought up. Adam, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We've had no, a please. caller. We've, we've actually had a caller on for the past 15 minutes. Oh, I'm going to bring him on. We got Johnny from Texas. Johnny, do you want to hop on the show? Hey, hello. How's everybody doing? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Quaid. Yep. Do you have a hello? question from? Yep. I hear you loud and clear. Do you have a question for Adam tonight? Well, it's more of a question, but it's an oversight. May uh, uh, may I overlay what he's uh, getting at? Because he touched on a lot of great topics when it came to the Middle East, 9-11, everything that's happening, the spies. Uh, if I could ask an overlay question. By all means. Okay, great. All right, sir. So when I turned uh, when I tuned in, it was at uh, eight forty five my time, Mountain Time. You were talking about how nine eleven was happening with the Patriot Act and this and this and that. We all know what's happened since nine eleven. Um, I'm totally on the same page as you when it comes to nine eleven. There was some inside job. Something was happening. A lot of people have the conspiracy theorist of. Uh, um, there may have been thermite, obviously, that brought down the Twin Towers, which I truly believe, and the testing in the scientific community has brought a, a force. You mentioned that, the explosives that you mentioned about. But uh, besides the point, when it comes to 9-11 um, and the towers happening, I was trying to get more back towards the Patriot Act and foreign policies. So I just want you to to hopefully understand that I'm on the same side as you when it comes to 9-11 and explosives and, and, and planes, because if you really want to talk about it, how did one plane bring down a trade uh, tower center, but it didn't bring down the Pentagon? You know, it collapses a whole tower and, and smolts it, but then you cannot have one plane hit the Pentagon and there's no wreckage. So 9-11 is where I stand on that when you just talk about physical proof and um, just making it simplistic. But you were talking about the foreign policies in Pakistan and Israel and Saudi Arabia. This is a great point that you brought up because we're seeing a lot of the OPEC trade that's happening with oil and foreign policies abroad. Uh, Venezuela is a big part of this. A lot of people don't think, but it is with Saudi Arabia. The Patriot Act, I believe, at the same time has been there to suppress us on talking about foreign policies, such as what's happening in the Middle East. We're now seeing this in the Middle East with the Multinational Acquisition Act in Europe, EU, UK. And they pretty much have the same scripture and the same documentation as the American Patriot Act that was signed in 2002, October uh, 2002. So one month, one year later, the Patriot Act was signed thanks to 9-11 and the quote-unquote weapons of mass destruction that were abroad, which we all found out that that was a false falsehood within itself. 
But when you were talking about the spies, I really found that interesting. The reason being is because recently in the news media, we're seeing the new stuff that's happening with George Stephanopoulos, the spies abroad when it came to the Trump administration, Hillary Clinton, Uranium One. I believe internationally through the United Nations that they're trying to tie these international spies, these foreign diplomats that you were speaking of, of uh, being spies, in the Middle East, uh, Pakistan, Israel, everywhere. People need to be reminded, and I hope, I, I'm, I think you're under the understanding of this, people need to be reminded the Middle East policies, the Middle East problems did not start during 9-11. It didn't even start during uh, uh, um, Desert, Desert Storm, Desert Shield. It didn't even start in 89. It didn't even start then. It actually started in the 1957 era during the Cold War when it came to energy production. You were touching upon about that when it came to energy production and I got to and everything that. that were happening. Johnny, but my question is to you is Johnny, where do you see that happening? Johnny, Johnny, host is talking to you. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, when I'm talking to you, you got to, you got to, Johnny, I think you're incorrect with the 1950s with the Cold War. Uh, the instability in the Middle East actually happened when the Middle East was being carved out by this artificial state called Israel itself. And there was a lot of Arabs displaced, and the whole Middle East has to pretty much circumvent around and have to basically cater for having the state being implanted. And a lot of the destabilization that's been happening in ever since 1947 with the establishment of Israel is all because of us doing dangerous missions for Israel itself and doing Jewish wars for, for that benefactor. And that's the primary um, reasoning for the instability in the Middle East. And then secondary is really the resources. I believe in that as well. And I'm not, I, I hope you don't think I'm trying to contradict any of what you're saying. All I'm trying to get at, uh, Mr. Quaid, is um, we're seeing a lot of fractions happen. We all understand 9-11 was a false flag. I'm pretty sure we could all agree upon that. So just as a starting point, let's start from there. All I'm trying to say is recently within the news media is we've been seeing MI6, the Russian agents, all these people, George Stephanopoulos, now coming to a head when it comes to international spying. We understood this in 2016 when it came to Barack Obama, quote unquote, spying on Angela Merkel. We all remember the stories and all that. That was just the straw man. And what I'm trying to really boil it down to, and my question to uh, your guest is, is we understand that multinational corporations, government entities have been working abroad amongst each other to false faith this story. It, it doesn't matter if it's the Jews. It doesn't matter if it's the Syrian rebels. It doesn't matter if anybody. Really, all that matters is America is trying to swing their dick around. And if America swings their dick around, I don't know if we could say this on air, but then we have another ma massive crisis abroad, all in general. It all goes back to energy supplies. It all goes back to these raw resources that everybody's fighting over in Southern America, Venezuela, uh, North Korea. They have the biggest. They have the biggest. Um, uh, they have the biggest reserve when it comes to zinc and magnesium and all these other raw resources that charge our phones. It's an energy crisis. We knew it from day one. My question was to the caller. And I was trying to overlay some of this as what I understood on my behalf is, isn't that what we're seeing? Really? It started with Israel. It started with Saudi Arabia. It started with some of these Middle Eastern countries. Even since the Cold War era, even since Desert Storm, Desert Shield, it's slowly perpetuated to what it's at. And then boom, 9-11. And then we're back over there. And just within the last 72 hours, the last three days, we're seeing missiles being shot by Israel and some we're hearing reports of military uh, um, aircraft carriers going into the Mediterranean area again, back into that area, the Black, the Black Sea and all this area. 
I believe that there's something else happening. If you see that, I was just asking about that because just recently there's a lot of action happening yeah, in Pakistan. I, I, yeah, you know, in, that. yeah may, may I answer that right away? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I I, I think this is a very important point, and um, I, I just, there's a lot of uh, historical data to, be, to, to uh, find out. It's not just about uh, the fossil fuel industry regarding uh, what we're seeing in the intervention with the Middle East. It is, it is one entity, uh, but there also the Iraq war was not about uh, capturing the oil fields. It was about um, replacing the Saddam Hussein regime. Now, I, feel, I, feel, I agree with you on the, the uh, latter point regarding what we're seeing today. I actually posted on my Facebook page regarding the, uh, the latest, well, uh, month logo uh, tariffs imported by Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State. Mike Pompeo actually threatened uh, Iran's oil uh, uh, exporters, saying that um, if you buy oil from Iran, you'll face economic sanctions from the United States. Um, and this is what usually happens before war. You weaken a country uh, by economically depriving it. And then you go to war when they're uh, de de depleted. Um, but also, what, to the caller, John, I think that was his name, Johnny, um, he brought up a good, an interesting point. I just had a conversation with uh, Leon Marrow, who's a, a very wise uh, kid. He studies geopolitics like myself. And I didn't put two and two together. He helped me out. And he stated that uh, Argentina is probably linked to what is happening in the Middle East. And I didn't put two and two together. I asked him to explain. And he gave me a long explanation. I'll cut it short. The, the reason for one of the reasons for the, for the U.S. Um, uh, involving themselves in Argentina was that Argentina is also home to the largest oil reserves in the world. And they... What, what he purported makes sense. It's sound, and uh, it actually makes sense. And he says that once the United States intervenes, and there's a new government that's catering to the United States' interests, what they'll start doing is uh, selling the oil from Argentina to Iran's uh, purchasers. So, in essence, cutting out Iran and uh, their, their largest uh, economic um, supply. And this is basically by design. Now, whether that actually happens or not, we'll have to wait. But for me, that sounded like a very plausible scenario. Um, the only thing I would disagree with the, uh, the caller is that, um, yes, physics, I'm totally ignorant. Roly Quaid, uh, I reiterate to him, I, I don't have a position on it because I don't like to assume whether they came down. And to me, it matters not. Whether they came down by explosives or not, you have to go right back into the field's that I'm already studying, and that's the geopolitics, because somebody had to put those explosives there, and those somebody are involved with the attacks of 9-11. It's not just Al-Qaeda. It's numerous agencies. It's not just Israel or urban moving systems, because what a lot of people don't uh, understand is that Saudi Arabia had actual nationals inside the United States. Omar al-Bayoumi was one, and Osama Bassan was another, who actually assisted the hijackers. They gave them funding, they gave them housing, uh, phones, they rented uh, houses in their name, and it wasn't like these people were living secretly. Khalid al-Minar and Nawaf al-Hamzi were living openly. Their names were found in the phone book. Now, the reason why was this. The FBI was not told by the CIA that they were already in the United States. The CIA withheld this information for 18 months. And when George Tenet went before the 9-11 Commission, and especially to the Joint House, he perjured himself because one of the Joint House members, Carl Levin, asked him, uh, did anybody read the cable where they got the information that Khalid al-Midar and Nawaf al-Hamzi had multi-entry visas from Saudi Arabia, the consulate? And George Tenet says, nobody read that cable. Well, guess what? Years later, that was found out to be untrue, 53 agents within uh, the Bin Laden Easter Station knew about that cable. In other words, they knew they, were, uh, they had multi-entry visas in the United States. Now, there were two agents from the FBI that were working in the station, and they found out about the cable, Mark Rossini and Doug Miller, and they tried to warn FBI that, hey, they're inside the United States, but they were rebuffed. 
In fact, Mark Rossini was threatened with legal action, and Doug Miller, uh, his cable was intercepted by Deputy uh, Director of the Alex Station, Tom Wilshire. And so they couldn't do anything. Now, the FBI didn't know about these hijackers until two weeks prior at a, um, a meeting uh, in the State Department between Richard Clark, uh, Richard Blee, who was a, the new station chief at Bin Laden's station, and their information was vague. So they tell the State Department and the FBI, um, yes, they have multi entry visas and they're in Los Angeles. They're not in Los Angeles anymore because they're in New York. And it was staying at a hotel. But the CIA knew this and didn't tell the FBI. And to make matters worse, the NSA monitored all the calls these hijackers had. As far back as 96, it's, it's implied, because they knew about the safe, all calls went through the safe house in Yemen, which, which was owned by Ahmed al Hada, who's the father-in-law of Khalid al-Midar. And all these high-profile al-Qaeda members were talking through this phone. Bin Laden, um, Mohammed Ata, military in chief, what have you. And they were talking about the Millennium Plot of 2000, which failed, the 2000 coal bombing. And if the NSA was bugging the house, uh, were monitoring the calls as far back as 96, well, then that means they knew about the coal bombing as well and the embassy bombings and didn't warn the State Department or the FBI. Now, the CIA tried, they bugged the house, but they couldn't listen to the phone calls, right? They could only hear what people were saying in the house. So they couldn't hear what the people who were uh, incoming calls, they couldn't hear them. So they asked the NSA to, to say, hey, can you give us the other half? We got one half of the cable. And this, the NSA would say no. The NSA, which I never hear anybody talk about, had primary, they, I, you can make the argument, I could, you can make the argument that they have foreknowledge of the attacks. Because who knows who's calling through that safe house in Yemen? You know Mohammed Atta was. You know Ramzi bin Shabib was. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was. Bin Laden was. All these people were. Yes, all these people I existed. Dick Cheney and John, uh, James Clapper knew about this? I didn't mean to interrupt you, but you're no, no. a great point. Yeah. Do you think they knew this? Because this is during the same time zone that they were in there. And oversighting well, a lot of that. And we're seeing well, just some to, of this happen right now. Yeah, that's true. Well, I, to, to go back to your point about James Clapper, he wasn't uh, in the NSA at the time. The director of the NSA uh, was Michael Hayden. And after him came Keith Alexander. But Michael Hayden, um, if you want to blame somebody, you could blame uh, uh, Barbara. Um, geez, uh, the last name's going to escape me. Because Michael Shore threatened the NSA. Uh, to give them the information on the other half of the cable, and uh, uh, Bob, Bob, who is the Deborah, the, uh, the, the the deputy director, know. the deputy director of the NSA at the time, know. she 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 threatened Michael Shoyer and said, "We'll take you to court." And Michael Shoyer dropped it. So basically, each agency had incomplete information, and they weren't sharing it. Now, one can make the assumption that the CIA wanted this to happen or the NSA wants this to happen, that's a stretch. Not impossible, but you can't prove it. It's a stretch. But you also have to lend the fact that also that these agencies didn't like sharing information, which is true. Do, do some of these people in these agencies have nefarious agendas? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's what the yeah. Patriot Act was. They said the FBI couldn't communicate with CIA and NSA, and that's the whole reason why they created the Patriot Act. Let's remember that part. Remember yeah, how they said all that? They sold it to us and they packaged it up? The Patriot Act is actually a long, uh, I mean, if you, if anyone out there listening, uh, if you cater to read the Patriot Act, it's in lawyer jumbo. It was meant to be that way because it was written by lawyers. Um, was yes, basically sir. about using the, using the term terrorism in a broad sense. And when they say terrorism, they're, they're implying that it's just re these religious extremists. But when you look at it civilly, judicially, it's not really defined. And terrorism itself is not defined. Um, that's why this war on terrorism is an ingenious idea by Dick Cheney. And when usually wars have uh, an opponent, a, a named upon a country uh, itself or a person, you go to war with somebody. Terrorism could be defined as anything. And 
the, the, the idea now that you're on a war. Answer. Right, but what I'm trying to get at is here is that. Uh, no, no, it's fine. I mean, the war on terrorism is undefined and it's never ending. And when Dick Cheney went on 2006 to meet the press, he basically says that the, the war on terrorism will not end in our lifetime. And what he's talking about is 60 to 100 years. And for me, I think it's going to be longer than that. And look what's happening. I mean, itself. I mean, um, we're going to war with just about basically everybody under the sun, except for the countries that had uh, foreknowledge or uh, some complicity in the attacks themselves, Saudi Arabia, Israel, Pakistan. Why are we hold these people accountable? Well, we held Iran accountable instead. Uh, we made a lawsuit regarding uh, that Iran was somehow allowing the hijackers to pass through, and the district court judge in New York, George Daniels, uh, basically said that because we respond to the uh, inquiry, they were sued by, the, by uh, Motley Rice, who was representing the families. But here's a key thing. A lot of the families opted out of the lawsuit because they wanted to go after the bigger players, which was Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and Israel. And so we can only hope that in the future that more files and more documents are released by the National Archives. And um, that's what I would say regarding the issues of 9-11 and who had foreknowledge. The NSA, I can absolutely tell you, because... Thomas Drake, who's a former analyst at the NSA, William Biddy, a uh, you know a brilliant mind, crypto linguist of the NSA, they tell you straight up in lectures, interviews. Yes, the NSA had biographical metadata on most of the hijackers, if not all. And the and Thomas Drake went before the 9/11 Commission and gave prima facie evidence showing the NSA had information that could have prevented the attacks from even happening as far back as 2000. And guess what the 9-11 Commission did? They made Thomas Drake's testimony uh, not made for public. And he is one of only, I think, two or three uh, public testimonies that are made public. Why is that? If you are a careful researcher, you go at the real anomalies of 9-11 because those are the more fascinating, the more historical, the more proven and they'll show you the, the, the complicit and intricate nature of 9-11. Because it wasn't just about four planes. 9-11 was, was supposed to be a much bigger operation. And maybe in a future show, I'll get into that, that point. Where, I'll just give you a small example. There was one plane called United Airlines Flight 23. This airplane was about to take off out of JFK. It was going to Los Angeles. They were on the runway, and they got the call from Gerald Arpey, who is the, the manager of, of uh, United Airlines, saying that all United Airlines are to, to return, not to depart. So they went back to the gate. While they were going back to the gate, a stewardess went on the telecom saying, um, we have to depart. We're not uh, flying. Uh, you have to leave the plane. Three Arab men got up and started arguing with the woman, saying that they had to leave, they had to fly, and they wouldn't take no for an answer. So the woman was very distressed, and she actually called security. So while they're letting the people leave the plane, they left too, and they left in the crowd, and nobody really followed these people. When security got to the plane and the FBI, the only luggage that was left was the luggage left by these three people. And what did they find? Well, they found knives, box cutters, and uh, pilot's uniforms. These people were a part of the operation. This instance was never respond, was never investigated by the 9-11 Commission, even though Bob Graham, who was the co-head chair of the Joint House Inquiry, even states in his book um, much later on, he says that there is a, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that one, more planes were to be involved. Now, this is very important because what I, this is what I believe on the premise of 9-11. 9-11 itself was a terrorist operation. When I'm saying terrorist, I'm talking about uh, these terrorist Arabs or uh, religious fundamentalists. However, the operation was found out by the intelligence apparatus of Israel and the United States. 
mainly the Mossad, the NSA, and the CIA. And what they did was manipulate 9-11. And they uh, manipulated the attacks and allowed, you can make the, I wouldn't say they, they were complicit because I have no evidence for it. But they, you can make, I, I can make the argument that certain people within these agencies were complicit in allowing the attacks to happen. On the other hand, you could say that they just didn't share the information, what have you. I can make a really good argument that these people, certain people, not all of them, allowed these attacks to happen for the bigger picture, which was the war with Iraq, Afghanistan, the, uh, the, to get rid of these uh, nationalist Arab leaders that were in Syria and Lebanon. Look what's happening today. It all has a correlation back to 9-11. Everything you see today happening in the Middle East, happening with the United States within their borders regarding their civil liberties um, and around the world is all directly related to the attacks on 9-11. And these attacks could have been prevented if this information was just shared or if these people uh, didn't have these influences or agendas, these nefarious agendas in basically allowing the attacks to happen because, you know, Tenet and Kofor Black uh, Dale Watson, all these people from the CIA, they all lie. And that's why every day on, on my Facebook, I post um, the interviews of both the Joint House Inquiry and the Island Tax. I don't post them in their entirety. I break it down. And it took me three months to do this because they're long. I mean, 9-11 Commission took two years, Joint House, a couple of months. But to break down the interviews each, it, took, it was a long time. But what I'm trying to do is help you, the listener itself, to get a better grasp at uh, what these intelligence agencies uh, have allowed to happen and to not cater to these wild conspiracies like no planes. And just, just to make this real short, when people say no planes, I do not believe they understand the fatal flaw at what they're doing. And I made a video not uh, this week, past weekend. It's two and a half minutes regarding the hours. And I'll just basically break it down for you. When people say there's no planes, usually these people like to blame the CIA or Israeli Mossad. But when they do this, they don't realize they have just eliminated the Israeli and Mossad from having any foreknowledge or complicity in attacks. And I'll basically explain why. Because without the hijackers, you don't have hijacked planes. Without hijacked planes, you don't have passengers making calls, which is key. Without hijackers, you don't have urban moving systems following these opera operators around. Without the hijackers, you don't have the CIA monitoring these people for two years and then not allowing the FBI to get involved in arresting these people. That may, I ask, is that, may I ask a question on that? You, you oh, go ahead. Yeah. Break. No, go ahead. Go ahead. And, and, and it's just a simple question. Please elaborate more. But uh, I, I think we've all seen this, but I think we're afraid to ask the question. Is this the implementation of socialism? We get robotic automation planes. We get robotic automation cars. And this is the rollout of socialism 2.0 and the fear of terrorism. And we all remembered this in 19. Uh, 2001s and the early 2000s. We're like, oh, the world's changing. But I feel like this was almost a terrorist attack abroad domestically within the human population of America that capitalism is bad. Capitalism shouldn't be great. And they're going to make you safer by rolling out robotic automation of planes and cars. So I don't know if you indulge in that, but I, that was my question to you. I uh, foresee yeah. that. Do you see that? No, I don't, actually. Um, actually, uh, the broader uh, reasons uh, for allowing these attacks is uh, a multitude of reasons. Um, and one is U.S. military expansionism. Two is to cater to the, the foreign lobby institutes of Saudi Arabia and Israel in destabilizing uh, their preconceived enemies, Saudi Arabia, uh, which is the Shiite nations of Syria, which is what's happening now, um, uh, Libya, and, of course, the ultimate goal in eliminating the uh, the largest contingent of Shias in the world is Iran. And uh, it's Iran that Israel considers the biggest enemy. And believe it or not, uh, the irony of that is that Iran is actually uh, quite friendly to Israel. In fact, 
the largest percentage of Jews outside the United States and Israel resides in Iran. Um, but no, I, I think the the bigger picture regarding uh, the 9-11 itself comes from uh, Israeli expanding, expanding its borders um, and also keeping at bay uh, Saudi Arabia's uh, preconceived enemies of the Shiite nations itself. Um, the Gulf, the Gulf Coalition, Saudi Gulf Coalition, look what's happening in Yemen. It's basically uh, a part of the fault of the United States because the United States actually gives them funding. And the irony of all this is that Saudi Arabia actually gave birth to these people who, uh, whose ideology uh, created these um, previous uh, attacks itself, aided and abetted by the intelligence apparatus. Just like what happened. Adam, I got a Saudi question United. for you. Sure. Have you ever heard of Peter Del Scott's um, safari plan? It's something that he broke in the 1980s. It was this oh, idea yes. of yeah. Israel gets the greater state of Israel. And you know the four bar, the two bars, I should say, on the Israeli flags are the um, is the Euphrates and then also the Nile, and that's what Israel has claimed. And um, also um, for the Arabs to allow that to happen, in particular in the Gulf states, um, Saudi Arabia gets Oman and Yemen, which they're bombing the hell out of now, and also Qatar itself. And they cut ties off. Saudi Arabia did with Qatar just recently, just a couple of years ago, like two years ago, right? Um, they made it illegal to, for a Saudi citizen to actually wear a Qatar sauce, um, soccer jersey. And soccer, of course, is very popular in the Islamic world. And also Iran, which was supposedly cut out of this plan that was made in 1975 because of the, the Iranian revolution, um, was supposed to get all the stand countries. Because uh, you, they're, they're very much like related to the Persians, you know, um, the Afghanis, the um, Uzbekis, and uh, um, the Pakistanis, you know, um, all the Shiite. stand countries. Yeah. And uh, they might not be Shiite, but um, ethnically, you know, they were related to um, the Persians more so than anybody else in the region. Pakistanis got a little bit of like uh, Indian heritage in them. Basically, you know, they're, they're mostly Persians themselves. Um, their language is Urdu. They don't speak Farsi, but I'm talking about in terms of, like, racially. But um, having said that, um, did you know that actually Peter Del Scott actually to- coined the phrase deep state itself? It has made mm-hmm. its own, like, perverse term with Donald Trump. I don't even know if, uh, if Donald Trump knows who Mr. Scott is, but I was just wondering if you heard anything about the safari plan before. Uh, well, I, I had it mixed up. Um, actually, uh, there's a uh, intelligence apparatus that once existed in, during the uh, Reagan administration. It was called the Safari Club. And um, Pete Dale Scott also actually uh, talks about this issue as well. The safari plan is new to me. Um, but I'm, I'm actually a, a fan of Peter Dale Scott. I enjoy listening to him, um, and I actually watch a lot of his lectures whenever he tries. Uh, to, I know he's very old these days and uh, is not as, as active as he used to be. Um, but he's a great person to look into the real deep uh, historical narrative, like if you want to believe that there's a deep state or um, that there's an intelligence apparatus within the intelligence apparatus that is working outside of, like, say, the White House. Uh, we saw this example in Iran-Contra, where this, the, the White House had no idea what the intelligence apparatus was doing. Um, so it goes to show you that each entity within the government has their own goals and ideals. It's not just basically one gigantic conglomerate with one goal. Uh, it's not as simple as that. The United States government is a multitude of corporations, foreign lobby institutes, private donors, and these people have specific agendas in mind, but the overall goal is to keep power at the hands of the few. And um, it, it, you have to investigate the matter very thoroughly to understand the better understanding of what these intelligence apparatuses are, because um, what a lot of people don't realize is that the NSA is not the largest intelligence apparatus in the world. It's actually the GCHQ. And they're in Great Britain. 
And there are five major intelligence agencies, and they're called the Five Eyes. Uh, Australia, Canada, Great Britain, United States, and uh, I am missing a country. Uh, don't. Uh, um, Germany. Germany. Canada. Maybe, uh, is it? I, I, you know what? They're all, uh, they're all English-speaking countries. So it's United States, yeah, Canada, yeah, Australia, you, 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 Australia you, 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 New Zealand, and yeah, then Britain. Yeah, don't, Right, don't condemn me for the, the final. But the, 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 the overall apparatus is called Five Eyes. And generally, if you, you mention uh, Five Eyes... Adam, did you actually yes. hear Benjamin Netanyahu saying that, um, giving a speech, and he says that you think the Five Eyes, and he just named the five we just mentioned. He's like, but did you know Israel's actually the second eye? Well, Israel likes to pump itself a lot. Um, and let, let, let me put it very clear. Israel doesn't run the United States. And I will tell you right now, the United States runs Israel. Yes, Israel has a great influence on in our politics, very wide, and it goes back a long time. But let me be very frank. Israel reinforces yes. America's Middle East policies as such North Korea does China. I, to, a point, Israel. Uh, to a point. To a point. Do you agree with that? I, 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 would, I would disagree slightly. I, I think... Okay. You're, you're, you're not totally wrong. I'll, I'll, I'll just say that much. But the, the general position is that Israel and the United States are inexplicably linked in terms of their uh, foreign policy, which is an impossibility. No two countries are alike in anything. Israel has a different agenda than the United States. The United States actually wants to govern the world. Israel doesn't. Israel just wants to expand its own little borders within that region. The United States but itself. Adam, Adam I, yes. isn't, isn't it the PNAC group and the APAC um, group itself that thinks um, the United States itself is um, a sole unchecked superpower and we need to act like it and we need to knock over nations and decapitate the leaders all for the behest of Israel's enemy in the region? They, they do act in accordance because neoconservatives are similar in their tenets to Zionism. And, and I'm talking about Likud Party Zionism, not nationalism itself, not moderate. But, but they are Zionists. It's one and the same, like APAC. But, and I, I, APAC. I, yeah, well, well, no, no. I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is that neoconservatives themselves have a different agenda. And their agenda is also outlined in the Project for New American Century. And their agenda is the military uh, expansionism within the region. And also, too, to also add uh, to that, there was a document even before that written by even harsher neocons like Richard Pearl and Douglas Feith, who actually are on par with the, the Luka party. And it's called the Greater Israel Project. And in the Greater Israel Project, is, is a, the example is that they wanted to actually have uh, a better understanding of who the PLO was and to restrict them in their power, to restrict the, the national states, the Arab national states. And we're seeing that today. This is not anti-Semitic in the least. These people are, uh, there's, there's, there's a multitude of reasons for this. And it's not just Israel. It's the United States, Israel, Great Britain. question? Yes, please do. On that topic? Go ahead. Um, we, we understand Israel has been under a fraction of sorts for a long time. I think that's what we all agree upon. My question in particular is, is, um, how do we not know that the Jews or Israel has been uh, up front for a while, especially with the Nazi regime, a few wow. things, a few fractions? We could blame America, which seems to be the new uh, talking point recently, and Israel. And that's okay, but if we were to touch hey, Johnny, upon all these say, topics... You that said, we like, about, um, in league with the Nazis? They got stamped out. My question, it wasn't a, it wasn't a, it wasn't a difficult one. I don't mean to interrupt, Mr. Quaid. It was just as to the extent that uh, we understand the Jews are not good. They controlled the banking systems for a while. That's what makes America and all these international corporations. We're at, this, we're at the we're at this we're at this uh, we're at this fork in the road. Where America could back away from the United Nations, which I think a lot of Americans believe we should. And then we're at this point where Israel's a part of the United Nations, other countries are part of the United Nations. We were sold the false flag of weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East of Iraq and Iran. And we're at this focal point right now, I see, 
and I think we're all touching upon it and different aspects of this, but we're seeing that are we going to keep fighting in the Middle East? Are we going to keep fighting over oil and uh, religion? Or, or are we going to back away from that of sorts? I think we already question. answered that question. It's a hundred years of perpetual warfare. Um, can you go ahead and answer that question from real quick, Adam? I'm just trying to interject because we do have a fifth caller tonight, and okay. I do want to get him in. Sure, uh, real quick. Um, I, I see this as a a problem with uh, those of the truth community as well is that they like to assert that Israel itself as an entity is a primary reason for most of the problems in the world, and they're not. But it also doesn't absolve them of uh, their past crimes and the current crimes, which is continuing. It's not as simple as infiltrating big banks, uh, the, the, the uh, United Nations. Yes, they have, they have influence. But to, to, to report that, you know, some of them were Nazis, incidentally, ironically, to touch on that subject, it's usually uh, the nationalists, these white nationalists that we see, these fringe elements, they're not a really big group, that like to blame Israel for the 9-11 attacks. And, um, you know, they're doing themselves a disservice because it's not, it's not just them. And I think that's important to state. If you're going to look at Israel or if you're just going to look at religious Muslims, you're doing yourself a disservice. I'm telling you right now, and I can't make this any more clear. If you think 9-11 is that simple, boy, you are going to be in for a rude awakening when you do in-depth research. And you're going to find an overwhelming response of, of information that uh, repudiates that worldview vehemently. And, you know, a lot. there's a lot that was involved with 9-11. And, yes, Israel is indeed a part. They were inside the United States. They acted as an intelligence apparatus. Yes, Adam, they knew. Adam, um, it seems that the gentleman, the call dropped, and we do have another caller in. Please, let's I get, get to him. him. Yep. Yep. Sure. Absolutely. We have another caller, caller from California. Is this Eric? It is. Good evening. Hey, um, very interesting thing about Adam. People don't know. It seems like he's in a class by himself one who claims to be not a debunker and not a truther. So it's, um, I approach this very cautiously, but just want to get right down to the core of, you know, of the foundation of 9-11 and what he really believes, because that, you know, and then you can tell from that core belief where it goes. So, um, you know, my first experience debating 9-11, I went um, on a debunker, truther page debate page and adam was the first person i ran into and he claims not to be a debunker nor a truther by the way can everyone hear me That's yes I can, I can hear you i can hear you you're, you're loud and clear and you're saying that he's okay. like um in between those two camps itself and um he, yeah and he's so, he's so allowed to be I in a category to... in himself um adam do you yeah. want to answer that question yeah, I'll answer that real quick because I think he's got other questions. I just want to point that out right away. When I say I'm not a debunker or a truther, I don't uh, adhere to the tenets of what they believe. Gen I made this quite clear earlier. The, the, the general position regarding debunkers is that uh, they, they believe it was religious fundamentalists that created this attack. For truthers, it's a, it's a myriad of explanations. It's not one explanation. They, they contradict one another. So I don't, I don't adhere to those properties because 9-11 isn't just about uh, religious fundamentalism. It isn't just about Israeli apparatus. It wasn't just about the CIA. It's basically a conglomeration of all those things. And yeah, it when, comes down to what is true and what isn't. And I'm a pretty simple person. I mean, these towers, what I wanted to say is when I came on that debate page, what I first wanted to point out is you really come across more as a debunker. There was no sign of you adhering to anything truthers were saying as I'd watch the page and watch what you'd say. You were very hostile to people that would claim the towers came down by pre-planted explosives. And I wanted you to answer that question. Did the towers come down by pre-planted explosives or did they come down as the original account tells us they came down? Okay, just I, I'll, I'll, I'll answer both of your points. One, the former. Um, I have no position. And the reason why is because I don't know anything about so, physics. Okay, hang on. I don't mean to interrupt. You don't have a position. You can say that, but 
in reality, you come across as a debunker hardcore. I mean, you're a debunker. You, I mean, you, people say, we, we show how the towers come down by pre-planted explosives. And by the way, it is a no-brainer. These things blew up. They were rigged to, to come to the ground. That's not okay. even a debate. I, 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 even if they were, it wouldn't, it wouldn't dissuade from the points I was making earlier. And to, to reiterate I'm the fact that... I'm not talking about earlier. I'm talking about that you come across as a debunker. And, you know, even well, just well, to answer it, the simple question, did these towers come down by pre-planted explosives? I, you know, you I don't know. On the subject. I have well, no idea. You you don't know. Let, let me ask you. Let me ask you. How do you. I'm sorry. I don't want to interrupt. And I just want it to be clear and not have us go crazy. But, you know, you have a thousand bodies that disappeared, not even a trace of DNA. That only happens by explosives. You have 220 acres of concrete turning to little pebbles and powder. That only happens by explosives. This isn't a debate. The towers came down by explosives. And so, you know, so you, you come across as a debunker in the sense that you confuse things. Because that's the whole idea of a debunker is to just get your mind off the, the simple reality that these towers came down by explosives. Okay. You know, and I also okay. notice you don't can care about the new investigation either. You, you know? What, what, um, well, can, can, I, can I respond? Yeah, sure. I'm sorry. Okay, no, uh, well, I wanted to make sure you were finished. Um, regarding debunkers, is, is it just pertaining to the towers themselves, physics? Because the broader picture is much more important. Because if you prove that explosives were in the towers, like I said before, you have to go right back into the areas I'm studying in, which is the geopolitical. That means either uh, United States or some entity external planted those bombs in the building. Am I right? Right. Okay. I so want to just say no, because people. Wait a minute. Wait. 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 Okay. Let, let, can I interrupt? You. 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 Yes. I, I'm actually. I'm. I'm giving you a hypothetical where I agree with you, and now you just said okay. no. They wouldn't be complicit. Now, I, I'm talking fast. Let me slow it down. Let me. Let me slow this down for a bit. Yeah, Even if I let, let's say I agree. Okay. Let's say I agree with you, Eric. Don't interrupt Adam so much. Let him talk. I'm sorry. That's right. Let's say I agree with you. I'm that, new to this. I'm a little bit nervous here, but that's what like, Doug. Take your time. Listen. Take your time. It's okay. Just, just be cool about it. Just to, just try to let uh, Adam talk yeah. a little bit. There has to be oh. a little bit of dialogue, otherwise it's not radio worthy. Wait. Let's say I agree. Let's say, Eric. Let's say I agree with you, and um, they came agree down with by explosives. Me on what count? Agree with that they, what? that they that they came down from explosives. Okay. Okay. You have to now agree that some external agency or the United States itself, uh, through their agencies, pre-planted the buildings with explosives, Absolutely. right? Right, okay. Absolutely. That, that, the United that, that, States didn't do anything reluctantly. Right, okay. Now you have to go about this in the terms where I'm coming from. Now you have to research the areas of the geopolitical. That means the broader range of topics – why I'm hard to go back to your previous point, why um, I'm harsh with people on the truth side, because they use this event to propagate conspiracies that blanket the actual anomalies, which I just presented earlier. And these anomalies implicate Saudi Arabia, Israel in, in for the attacks. And a lot of these people don't realize that when they say uh, no, like I, I give the example, no planes, they eliminate the possibility for any complicity or foreknowledge by Israel and, the United, and Saudi Arabia, right? And the United States. Well, you even spoke yeah. earlier. Am I interrupting? No, no, no go on. Go, go, ahead. Okay. go ahead. You spoke earlier that um, the United States has no influence on Israel. In other words, you conveyed earlier that Israel doesn't control the United States. Like, Yes, I, that's right. So, I said that. Okay. So when the tower is coming down by pre-planted explosives, which they did, the United States is, when, when we say inside job, it's the USA mostly accountable. They may have used other sources, but you can, inside you can, you can, you can, Well, I would, I would, I, the only thing I would disagree with you on is that I, I generally see this uh, slogan that 9-11 is an inside job, even though most yeah, of how the, do you, I, How do you define inside job? I define it as the USA being most accountable. Right. Well, 
See, now, there is no actual universal definition. And I would be in disagreement well, with the term. Well, there should be. Why, why? The United States didn't do this reluctantly. I mean, to, well, uh, this is not oversimplified, but look, we had the keys to the building. You know? Which we building? Those explosives in. The towers. You, you know? Who, who, uh, who had keys? Who, who had keys? Who had keys? Like I said, I don't mean to oversimplify, but who controls those towers? Who's who? The tell me. That's, who? All you? Really, that's all USA. Okay, you so tell me what's the what's the what's the okay, but you don't you see what you what you're doing is a, is a general problem that I see with people on both the debunkers and truth to side is that they're allowed to say that there's a point, but they never reiterate that point, and they keep going on making new points. What I'm trying to tell you is, if you're going to imply the United States, and I don't disagree there, um, and say that they had allowed explosives to enter the building because some security agency had keys, well, guess what? You now have to stop and point out who the security agency was and who they allowed to let in to put the explosives. You can't just, so, get, um, you can't just get away and say that they allowed the explosives. I, a, a, a real researcher worth the salt investigates every single point. So you understand what I'm saying? I, understand. I believe he elaborated on them already. Well, I, I do. Well, I, 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 I want to. Believe, I believe he elaborated them already. You were mentioning the CIA, and somebody had to. Well, um, no, well that, anybody yeah, was coming in to the back door. Yeah, but he's talking about a different issue. He's talking about uh, who's responsible for putting the well, pre packed explosives in the towers. Adam, you, of course, you're a little hostile to people who claim the towers came down by pre-planted explosives. And I've heard you say, yeah, there may have been a few bombs here and there. Well, what okay. about people that claim the original account, as I've heard um, Ryan Dawson with Adam Green, he kind of makes it sound like the original account, like fire brought down the buildings. Is the, look, look, Eric, I think, I think you're making a, a, a problem that shouldn't arise. You're conflating the 9-11 attacks with just the implosion of the building. That's where you're basically that's where it started. That's where it's, I mean, that's where it started. I'm tell, and I'm telling you that's a mistake. I'm not telling you to dismiss the physics. I'm friends with David Chandler. I'm friends with Ken Jenkins. I'm friends with Wayne Clasty. If I was a debunker, as you say I am, I wouldn't be friends with these people. You know why? Because I, I even explained to David Chandler. I said, I dismiss the crackpots, the fringe. Okay, there's a ton of them. Okay, the so how about the crackpot and the fringe being the original account where the towers came down by, by fire? You, Dawson you, says that. yeah, yeah, Ryan but you're, Dawson says that. I'm not Ryan Dawson, and I make it clear. May I intercede? May yeah, I go intercede on. on this one? Go ahead. Okay, uh, the caller, uh, I forget her, her name, bless her heart. What's her name? There was all men calling tonight, there was Johnny calling there's in. A, is that guy, is that guy still I don't around? want to play devil's advocate here, but I think we're oh, okay. all suppressing the point that we're all uh, trying to get at today. It's not against this. It's not about this. It's not even right. about how the towers fell down. I think what we're all trying to get at at the main end of the yellow brick road is, is where do we see America and the policies that forsake us? We all have a different opinion on this. And I think we lost sight of that a little bit when it comes to, okay, we understand 9-11 was not completely real. I think we all understand that. Any truther. Not think, completely no what? Little, completely real? Well, well I think you could have, you have your opinion personally when it comes to if there was explosives or it was a plane. We, we, we're not trying to digress the situation. I guess what we're really trying to get at, uh, and I'm just a caller as well, ma'am is what uh, What should we see as America's fortune? What should we see altogether? We understand this was all a bunch of shenanigans, the weapons of mass destruction, everything. And there's a few things happening abroad amongst America, and there's a few things to talk about as well. But just in general, where do we stand after all this? We could blame Muslims. We could even uh, suppress Christians or whatever. That's not the point. The point is, is where do you see, and I had a few questions as well, where do I see America 
We, I think that's what America needs to talk about a little bit more. Well, yeah, I, listen, I, Johnny, I agree with you. Just a quickly retort. Um, you're talking about the future after 9-11. Uh, this is an issue that I, I often bring up. Um, but it was um, great. I loved it. I enjoyed it. Yeah, no, I, I know we have. I know we have a, a lot of people. Yeah, no, no, no. Just a uh, reiterate. Uh, maybe in a future discussion uh, or call. Maybe he'll have me back, and we'll talk about that issue because it's it's not simple. It's a very broad. I, I, what to be quite honest, what happened after nine eleven is far worse than nine eleven itself. Um, and what's That's what's up, and, and, and what's coming. And what's coming? Hey, Adam, is, is, Adam, can I ask one parting question? Maybe you could ask me a little bit. What's Please your do. strongest reason for believing a plane hit the Pentagon? A large impact at the Pentagon. What, what's your strongest reason to believe uh, that? I know you believe that. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. I mean, you, you have to have the plane impact the building. And I, I reiterated this point, if you weren't around, I said that without planes and without hijackers, I'm asking you what your strongest reason for believing a 757 hit the Pentagon. What reason uh, do you have for believing that? Well, 138 people actually witnessed the plane crash into the building. The witnesses, and, okay. Anything else? And, uh, sure. I mean, you have uh, debris that was left behind. You also have the human remains that were covered by a forensic pathologist then sent well, over. That would open up a big box of worms. I don't see any debris. Uh, Jamie McIntyre, the moment it happened, said he only saw small stuff, small enough to fit in his hands. Um, what? Within an That's hour not, later, there's little pieces of the fuselage or whatever. That stuff was planted. Come on, well, you know that. No, actually wrong. You're, you're misquoting him. And and that's a due to no, a. No, I'm YouTube. not misquoting him. Yes, you yes you are because right before he the, says the that, the pieces were small enough that you could fit in your hand. There was no large tail section, wing section, fuselage, nothing like that. That was actually, yeah, actually, they recovered uh, parts of the engine in the sea. Yeah, I know. So, I'm telling you what the first report was, but later it changed, of course, to fit the yeah. narrative, whatever. Oh, that's wrong. It because a lie. It's a lie fir- to say a plane hit the Pentagon. And- the, fir- the, first, the first report actually came from CBS. They broke the news. Jamie McIntyre is actually misquoted by the people on the fringe of the truth movement. They say... I find well, it interesting. I find it interesting that President Bush said when the plane hit the Pentagon, it was a declaration of war. And that's why... Well, which is true. Chandler, well, that's Chandler right, that's- keeps propagating the Pentagon event. That's true. It is a it is a declaration. The wars that continue to keep going on, and the Pentagon is a hot issue within nine eleven. It has divided the movement. Are you aware of that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Who who would ever think that people are calling David Chandler not a truther? That that's reality today. Uh, Well, can I just can I just interpret? Can I just interpret? You made a great point. You made a great point, uh, ma'am. but they're making us fight about old wars. They're making us talk about old politics. But we understand what's about to happen, I think. I think we all feel it. That's exactly why we all came to this platform under Vision Media, and we understood each other's point of a per, uh, perspective. We understand that they're trying to make us fight about the old things, 9-11, bombs, uh, thermite. Who cares about that, really? I think the bigger point that we keep getting distracted by is that we need to know what we need to do as a community, as people, like-minded people, individuals that we are, to come together and have a a, a point of opinion and a respectable point of opinion. We could attack each other verbally, and that's okay, because I think we're all adults here. We haven't uh, haven't crossed that point of... This is a truth movement, not get along um, with people movement. Yes, you, you, you mentioned that, that the truth movement is being emphasized. You said the truth movement is being even infiltrated. I agree upon that. Some people believe in Q. Mm-hmm. Some people don't. Some people believe in this. Some people don't. The main point of the uh, uh, objective is that if we're going to start trading our contact information, are you going to give me your email? Are we going to talk about this? Can we elaborate on this? They want you to think, oh, Facebook deleted you or Twitter deleted you and you can't speak to this person. We're all trying to talk about one thing and one thing only, and that's the truth. And I don't know if you've been listening to earlier week's show, but that's exactly what it's boiling down to. Is this uh, suppression? No, that's actually Johnny. I'm not, I haven't been chiming in. 
um, I got Eric, Eric, you got some. Yeah. Actually, you know what? I got. I want to talk to Adam a little bit, and it's something that you were talking to Adam about. Okay. Um, the official story was: didn't the planes like vaporize inside um, itself, and they were able to draw out DNA? How is that possible, Adam? They recovered 184 of the 189 that were killed at the Pentagon. And but, but the thing about it is, like, what is a plane made out of? I know there's, like, wood and there's aluminum and titanium and steel. Can that absolutely, like, vaporize on impact, just gone with the wind? It's vaporized? Still have the DNA vaporized, yep. Yeah. It's vaporized? Where, where, where'd, you, yeah. where'd, you, where'd you get that idea? Well, like the idea that the the notion that in at the crash site itself, except at the Pentagon, you know, there was no fuselage. Um, that, that's incorrect. That's incorrect. They found fuselage in the sea ring. Hey, Adam, the, can I ask you a question? Sure. And by the way, may I just bring up a brief point, Eric? You're Eric Sandstrom. Correct. That's okay. What is um? What's your view on shills? Do you think they're um, a problem in the truth movement? You ever like, man? I can give me your thought on on shills, agents, people that are actually planted to cause confusion in this movement. Well, I, I come that, across a myriad of people like that. Well, yeah. Well, listen. Uh, I I actually agree with your point regarding uh, the infiltration of the truth movement. Uh, it goes back to the intelligence apparatus and trying to disseminate large organizations that are catering either to civil rights, which we saw with Cointelpro. And I wouldn't be shocked at all if uh, certain people within the truth movement are agents. Now, here's the difference between me and you. I don't go around telling people their shields without trying to prove it. And, well, here's um, the I, thing, Adam. You yourself told me that it's impossible to prove a shield, and I agree it is. At least Absolutely. now. Right, but you, you you shouldn't act paranoid and then try to label paranoid. everybody. I'm not paranoid. Well, I mean, paranoid. well, you, I know you, they exist, so why not call them out? You, you, no well, one uh, already knows you can't be definite. Should we call you a pedophile because, you know, we'll just make sure we'll play it safe? You understand? Now you see the problem that you're facing, right? You can't call somebody a shill just because they have a opposing worldview than yours regarding this event. And, well, uh, we know this, they exist. We know they exist. You agree okay. with that. You, it's impossible yes. to prove. And it only benefits the shill if we don't talk about them or speculate. Because they just run rampant. It is running rampant. And, that, that. and I'm glad you brought that up because that is exactly what is wrong with the treatment today. They speculate because of the people that are proponents of these fringe conspiracies that blanket the actual anomalies of 9-11, which I outlined some today. Um, and I say this very cautiously, and I don't say this, um, what's the word, with ad hom, you know, but there's many people that believe you're planted to cause confusion, that you are, in fact, a shill. It can't be proven, but people say that, and sure. I believe that. I, I believe that, and I, I don't mean that to be personal. It's just, you know. Listen, that's Eric, I, I even said... In the middle of the show, or just after the beginning, I made it quite clear that I don't want you to believe everything I say, anything at all. I want you to take what I say and you research it. Tell me, did Barbara Hunter ever say that? The plane hit the Pentagon. Come hey, on, Eric, 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 let me, Eric, let me, all right, let me ask you something, Eric. What happened to Flight 77? Say that a little slower, would you say? What happened to Flight 77? I can tell you this much: it did not hit the. What happened to him? I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't get right. See, see, Eric. See, Eric. That's the problem with you. You, you could definitely say Flight Seventy Seven did hit the Pentagon, but when I ask you what happened to it, you have no. You have no position on subject. I need to know. I need to know that. No, reality says no. Wrong. Wrong, Eric. Wrong, Eric. Eric, I would say that's a fatal mistake on your point. Yes, you do need to know. Because without knowledge, you are left with speculation. Well, that's here's all you the have. thing. It's President Bush, when a plane hit the Pentagon, he declared war. So it doesn't what, matter. What, what, is that, what does that have what to do? What matters is that a plane didn't hit the Pentagon. That's okay. what matters. Okay. That's all what right. the battle is. No one no. knows what happened to the real uh, alleged planes. 
Oh, uh, yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Oh, well, okay. Yes, we do, Eric. You know, I, think Eric. Now you get a, I think that you run off on a topic that really doesn't, there's no proof. You'll never be able to prove that. But Eric. We have evidence. We have video proof. No, you don't. 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 We have you, proof. No, that no. What, what proof? We didn't hit the Pentagon, but we have no proof. We can never arrive at any proof what happened to 77. So why even discuss it? What are you talking well, we about? Discuss whether or not a 757 or a large plane hit the Pentagon. Eric, I have, we have the ATC transcripts going from Indianapolis air traffic talking to the pilots themselves right before, right before they were hijacked. We have the flight path study. We have the debris. We have the human remains. And we have people that actually saw the plane. If, the, if 9-11 was about the operation of hijacked debris, plane, You don't have human Eric, remains. Eric, it, it, listen. That's fine. You you want to stick with that? That's fine. And this is not uh, the Eric and Adam show. And I didn't come here to specifically debate this issue because, for, for okay. to be honest, the, the debate is that's where the battle important. rages in nine eleven. Though that's where the, the Eric, Eric can I can I ask you something? If you don't have hijacked planes, you have nothing. You don't have complicity by the intelligence apparatus, by the CIA, the NSA, Israel, or Saudi Arabia. You are left. I made that quite clear. You have nothing. No one's monitoring them. them Reigns in the socialism that they preach against is what I foresee. Well, okay. Just but that, another that, take on that. Right, but I, 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 I don't uh, point out. I, I think don't you're right. I don't agree with that. So, answer. Adam, I, you don't believe it was military planes by remote control that hit the towers? What evidence do you have that they were remote controlled I'm military just, I'm, not, I'm just saying you believe it's the actual alleged original account, flight, uh, what is it, flight 11 and flight 175, is that right? Yeah, that's right. One, 11. Yes, so you believe it was actually those that hit? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Why well, would that's the, origin, that's the original account? Good for no, you. No, it's the, you're wrong. You're wrong. What's the original There's account? The original What's account. the yo? That's your original account. There is no original account. Well, the original account that our government tells us is flight eleven and flight um, one seventy five hit the towers, and you just right. And is that is that is that. is that what nine eleven is? I'm just to talking. you. I just wanted to get your view on what planes hit the towers, and you adhere to the original account. Wrong. You're, you're, you're absolutely wrong. You're absolutely wrong. Because I don't. You just told me. Did I misunderstand you? You said no. Flight 11 and Flight 175 hit the Pentagon. You said absolutely. You're making a clear mistake here. Yes. Those but you planes, don't believe that? Yes, you do. Yeah, yes, I do. But it's not basically four planes. 9 11. 9 11. You're making. You're making the big mistake and not looking at the bigger picture. 9 11 isn't just about See, four this is planes. Where you call it confusion. Wrong. You're not, bas- you're not understanding. You think 9 11 is about one day. I That's understand that four- you believe the original account on the, what our government you, told us about what you, planes hit the Pentagon. I just wanted to need. On to that issue, on that issue, but the official yes. account, the official account is not about four planes, it's much broader than that. And people, Adam, made, you actually believe Flight 93 impacted where our government said in the Pennsylvania field in Shanksville. You that's actually cool. yeah, believe that. Yes, yeah, and you know what? It's funny that you, because you agree. I think I want to misquote you, and I want to be sure you agree Israel had had, had complicity in these attacks. Am I right? Oh yeah, yeah. You can't deny Israel, but you know. All right, all right. No and, 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 well okay, of course. Okay, all right. Of so I just. Involved. Okay. But that has but nothing just, to do with you uh, believing uh, Adam, what happened with Flight 93? Was it um shot down or did the uh the crew actually fought with the hijackers itself? And where was the destination for night flight ninety three? Was it going to the White House? Yeah, there was numerous uh things about where the plane was going itself. One was CIA Langley, the State Department, even the Capitol. Um shot down, tough call. I don't know for sure. Uh, I mean, the debris field was long, but that's because Flight 93 was also carrying 53,000 pieces of mail and the lanyard itself. Um, as for the plane impacting uh, the old, uh, yes, it did. And in fact, I, well, why I, I wanted to ask Eric why you know he impl- implicates Israel in the attacks? Well, 
If you don't have Flight 93, 77, 11, 175 crashing, guess what, Eric? You just eliminated Israel from having any type of foreknowledge or complicity in the attacks. And you don't even realize it. Well, you what I didn't do realize is... You, you didn't even realize it. An actual 757 hit the field in Shanksville. And that's, it, that's irrelevant. I'm talking about your point. That's why I wanted to make it clear. That's why I asked you if you think Israel had complicities in the attack or foreknowledge. You said yes. But what you don't realize your position is erroneous is that by eliminating hijackers, eliminating planes, you just eliminated the intelligence apparatus of the Muslim. I don't. don't Can I finish? Can I finish? Can I finish? What you you do, what you do. It's like devil's advocate. It wasn't that, as I mentioned earlier, what the Patriot Act was. FBI didn't communicate with CIA. CIA didn't connect with NSA. Yeah. How the whole Patriot Act was Mm -hmm. implemented. Not really. Just to be clear, I thought we were on that page. No, uh, actually, uh, Patriot Act was enacted just to uh, enact the uh, the elimination. Two thousand two October. Yes, that's Second when Bush time. when Bush signed into a law. But Eric, when you you make the mistake by by saying no hijackers, no planes. Well, guess what? Now you don't have Israeli operatives following them around, and most of all, ninety three. Six calls in 93. I, I was going to bring this up earlier because I, I gave this information to Rolly Quaid uh, two days ago. 93 is a great example because supposedly Zia Jara flew that plane. And by you saying this plane didn't even exist or crash, you just eliminated another big conspiracy point, an actual anomaly. Zia Jara never got on that plane. Zia Jara actually had family who had links to Israeli operatives. Ali al-Jar, who's his uncle, and his brother, al uh, Asim al-Jar, were arrested in Lebanon for being Israeli spies for 25 years. But according to your worldview, Eric, these planes, hijackers, didn't exist. So that means you just eliminated, without even thinking, the Israeli uh, intelligence or the U.S. intelligence from having any complicity whatsoever or for now. And you don't even realize your position. That's why it's, an, it's a fatal mistake for you. I don't think you realize that all these details that you bring to the table have absolutely nothing to do with the reality that there's no plane that hit the field in Shanksville. Which, which you absolutely. Talk about all these details Eric, and the hijackers and all that, but when you Eric, get down to it and you look at that dirt lot, there's no plane. Eric, I, and I would tell you right now, you're wrong. There are people that saw. There are eyewitnesses who live in Somerset County who saw the plane. Are you telling me the numerous saw the plane? Okay, they, saw, they didn't say. You notice how you didn't say saw the plane hit the dirt, saw the plane immediately after it happened. You didn't say any of that. That's reality. The reality is, people didn't see the plane after it allegedly happened. That's you're wrong. You're, you're wrong because the first responders for that was there. Why, because you say so, I'm wrong, or no, because reality says I'm no, wrong. Eric. Because I could show you're wrong. I'm you sorry. Can, can I play can't. devil's advocate one more time? Can I just play it one more time? I'm so sorry. Why because not? you guys are both right. You guys both have great points of opinions. I've even thought about this myself as an independent uh, studyist of sorts. I totally agree with this. I've debated about this myself in my own mind. Now, can I ask one question to both of you? There's a big debate when it comes to, did a physical plane hit the trade tower, right? We understand that. And then then there's another question, is did there have a physical plane hit the Pentagon? Now, if you were to compare the two when it comes to mathematical mass times weight times speed, we could talk about that another day. We are past that point. My point to both of you is the million-dollar question that I think every truther has been asking themselves is even did a plane hit the Pentagon? And if the plane hit the Pentagon, the next question is, is did a plane hit the, the uh, uh, trade towers and vice versa? And so I think we're at this parallel that, did a plane hit the Twin Towers or not? Did a plane hit the Pentagon or not? Some people believe it's a missile. Some people believe it's a V-2 rocket. 
We could cover all these topics. But I enjoy your guys' conversation and your dialect. I really do. You guys are really bumping out elbows when it comes to just thinking about it realistically. I really am enjoying the show. Adam, but do you As a viewer, what do you guys think some, about that? Adam, do you not think that some of, uh, some of the event was carried out with deceptions? I mean, do you not? I, I, I think I made that clear, yes. And a lot of you weren't in on the call, absolutely. Hmm. And, and, and to reiterate the point, uh, I think it was Johnny that said it. Um, look, yes, actual planes hit these. Hey, Adam, planes. what about the people that saw a plane flying uh, past the lake after it allegedly has crashed? What are you talking about? Which uh, flight? Well, after the plane allegedly crashed in the field. I I'm, I'm, I don't know a lot about this, but I have heard people talk about the She's talking about the Pennsylvania one. Like the I shot over, over Pennsylvania. She's talking yeah. about that one. Yeah, I don't see. know a lot about that, but bottom well, line I, is for you to be believe a plane hit the field is just... It's what, just why? Like people who say no planes hit the towers. It's just kind of absurd to say... A 757 crashed at Shanksville. I mean, that's why is that? Joke. Why is that? Why is that absurd? Why? I want to hear your answer. Why is that absurd? Adam, really, when you look at just sim the simple evidence that there's no plane there. You're wrong. Where's the plane? A, yes, there is. There's evidence. They found the flight data recorder. They found the voice, the cockpit voice recorder, which actually, ironically, shows that there was a conspiracy in the plane. Without that cockpit recorder, we wouldn't know. And you dismiss this evidence of actual anomalies with the 9-11. I, I, I just find it fascinating with some people that they claim no planes. And meanwhile, they don't even give an offer or an explanation as to what could re replace this issue. Well, what, let me ask you, Eric, do you even believe in hijackers? I can't deny hijackers. It's all part of the deception. Absolutely. Mingle okay. the hijackers, add some okay. no planes. Absolutely. Okay. It's a it was a mess up in the air. Absolutely. Oh, okay. I'm sure there were okay. hijackers. Okay. I if they were the hijackers hit the buildings, though. What? What happened to them? <laughs> what happened? I don't know. I don't know. That is. The there, and there it is. <laughs> and that. And that's the end. That's the end. You oh, know so for sure. You know for sure. Did you study that? No, wrong. You no, know I'm for sure. I'm, 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 I'm not wrong. I'm going to bring up your error. You are for certain. You know for certain. Flight 77 did at the Pentagon. However, when I ask you, when I ask no you, when I ask you to say what happened at the Pentagon, you offer no explanation. You know why, Eric? Because you offer speculation. That's the difference between me and you and people uh, who actually research. I right? mean, I don't claim anything about 77 other than it did at the Pentagon. And then I go, Eric, and say, right. hey, gentlemen, and actually, I'm going to wrap up this show. Hey, right, guys, yeah, guys. I mean, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, no, that's fine. Hey, uh, let's do final thought, and we'll get uh, final thought on each of you gentlemen. Um, start lastly with Adam. Um, Johnny, do you have a final statement? And please keep it brief. Thank you, Mr. Quid. Uh, I agree with both of them. I just want to make that apparent from day one. As such, we touched upon a lot of topics. I, I I think the main problem that we're all forgetting, and I, I tried to mention this earlier, is that neither of us are wrong or right. The next step is we understand what's happening in the Middle East. We understand what's happening in Iraq. We understand what's happening in Iran. We had Obama give out $1.6 We hear about all this. The next thing is we have to understand where is America's foreign policies from here on out. We could talk about weapons of mass destruction. We could talk about 9-11. That's great topics to talk about because I truly believe, as such a guest that you had, uh, Mr. Quaid, is influential. This is vital for people to understand and to connect the dots of what is going on. Geopolitically, everybody thinks America is just swinging their dicks around. That's okay. But when it comes down to policies, yes. We have some problems to work out abroad. So it's great to have me on. Thank you so much. Richard, Revision Media, Willie Quad. Uh, 
I, I'm sorry Quaid. for uh, taking up so much time. <laughs> uh, do you want to retort or want me to talk? Or I guess he was just asking for your final thoughts, I guess. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, it yeah. Well, no, Eric, I, Eric I, I first of all, yeah, um, Johnny, uh, that was Johnny that spoke, right? Uh, John, thank yeah. you, first of all. Thank you for the call. Um, and I, 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 we're on the same page in regards to the second half after 9-11, in regards to where do we see this country uh, in regards to the endeavor of human affairs uh, in the world, and especially the Middle East, which is a hotbed for discussion here. Um, I, I would offer you this. I think the worst is yet to come. I think the war with Iran, I will, I will predict, will happen before the election because usually in times of war, they don't like change in the election. This would propose that Trump wins the second election. Um, you're already seeing the, the, the beginning stages of the U.S. military uh, action. Uh, well, yeah, I'll, I'll just stick with Iran for, for one because that's the big, the big issue. You're, you're starting to see the U.S. military going through the streets of Hormuz, showing off their military armaments. We're seeing economic tariffs against Iran, and we're, trying, and we're slowly labeling them as the greatest purveyor of terrorism in the world, which, uh, you know, ironically, is our allies. Um, so I agree yeah. with you, Johnny, there. I think the future, and I think, um, yes, I, I share your, dis, uh, your concern regarding um, what the public needs to do is pay more attention. I recently put a post on my wall this Saturday uh, that people were more infatuated with Game of Thrones than what was happening Sunday night, because <laughs> on Sunday night we had, um, we had the invasion into Gaza by the military, the Israeli military, and you had the U.S. military passing through the streets of Hormuz in a show uh, you know, to show them that, uh, you know, we're capable of destroying the country. But um, the, the, the disposition of the United States itself is that the people are either too inherently divided to care, to do anything about it, or the worst, that they I just agree with that. don't care. Or, or they just don't care. And I, you know, even don't go by my opinion, because I'm a pessimist. I happen to think the worst of the future. But if you're an optimist, what you hope for is to have um, the people itself, uh, to have enough percentage of people to rise up and pro protest what's happening. But um, I, I just don't see well, thank it. Thank God and for revision and other platforms. Thank you. Thank you. Very well, much. Have a good night, Johnny. Um, Eric, do you want to say yes. something before I close out this show? You know, I don't have too much to say other than... Um, I just Contact me on that, Facebook. Uh, we'll stay in touch, man. Um, All right. Maybe just, you, maybe I, we could make I a personal think, call. Um, you you did a very, very good job for I, your first time on radio. I know that yeah, cool. the nerve factors and there's a bunch of factors you know going on to you know doing live radio. Yeah. You did a very good job. Have a good night, Eric. All right, thank you, Adam. You're a very yes. good guest. Um, oh, do you have a? <laughs> yep, it was yeah, very no. good to have you on tonight. Well, well, first of all, thank you for even allowing me to. Uh, be on the show and um, little little he do there with Eric. I'm, I'm familiar with him, and you know I have him on block because he keeps thinking I'm some agent. And you know what? Hey, you don't know. Uh, you don't know anything about anybody, right? But um, you took me off block when I joined the Dawson page, and then you guys right. Took me but, off but, page yeah, Eric, but but yeah, but Eric, the point is, is that you know you just can't keep calling people shills who disagree with your worldview. It's I didn't come on that page and call anybody a shill. I posted a Craig McKee article about Dawson and it was all reality. And I find it quite telling that Dawson had nothing to reply to it. If I had someone writing an article about me, what he, I mean, I would have been on it, but Dawson. Eric, Eric, the re quite you, telling. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, you know why he didn't respond? And he was, he, said, he was suspended okay. from Facebook. He was suspended. He was on a 60 day suspension. That's why he couldn't respond. Is he still on it? He just got off it. Yeah. Okay. And well, and to be quite honest, good, he, you, uh, why don't you call Craig McKee? Do you did you read that article about Dawson that Craig McKee wrote? Oh uh, yes, I did. In fact, Craig McKee, I actually I'm glad you brought him up. I just put him on block because for the fourth time, I've asked him to debate me one on one using a, a website called Callout. I don't want an audience. I remember that. I I, I want to, uh, I'm, I want one on one, and that's because it's just basically me and you. Your information, my information, who wins? 
I don't. Yeah, Greg, I would like. I would really like Craig to do that with you. Greg, right? No, he, he. First of all, he won't do it. He wrote. He he refused to debate me. Not once. Not twice. Not three times. Four times. And that was it for I me. Think, right. That's well, it for me. You might that. have a good reason for that, but um, maybe yeah. that will change in the future. I would like to maybe meet you on that intermediate. What's it called again? Yeah, it's called call out. Q A L L dot O U T. Okay, I'll figure that out. I remember you showed me before, but um. You know, you can always unblock me, and I'll be civil. You know, I really will. I don't care. Yeah, gonna... listen. You, you, yeah, I just want to make it clear, Eric. You having the position you have now is not the offense. When you label people shows and agents, like it's boring. Well, I don't always do that. You know, it's just I. Br- I just like to bring it to the table since everyone what? sees and knows they're out there. So just lay it on the table. And okay, so then what? Gonna... Right, but I'm, I'm overboard, and that I, you can fault me for that, and, and I'll uh, try to watch that. Eric, no, I, I I only fault you, not of your passion. You got plenty of that, and I fault you for rushing to judgment, and that's all. And mm-hmm. I'll, I'll use the analogy for you, if you because because shields are out there, you don't know who it is. It's almost uh, it's like the, the the point I brought up to you earlier. I'll just call you a pedophile because pedophiles are out there. You just can't call people shows yeah, the for they, no reason. You just can't do well, that. Come on. Oh, there's a lot I could say about that. I mean, come on. You don't claim to be a debunker. You don't claim to be a truther right there. Right. Oh, I'm neither one. Confusion. Why? Because I disagree you with the confusion, tenu- confusion, Adam. You cause er- confusion. You er- don't er- answer er- essential questions. You're wrong. You talk about I all st- stuff the general public has no idea about. Really? You can look it up? Eric, I just said earlier, I just made it clear. Don't believe anything I say. I made that clear. Take what I say, you look it up. It doesn't have any bearing on advancing the truth of 9-11 and seeing justice and having the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Truth excel in their investigation. You, you, You just explained your position. Your position makes certain that anyone else who opens up an investigation and is serious will automatically be labeled a loon. And guess who made that? Alex Jones. Alex Jones made all this because he is a nut job. But guess what? He actually isn't. He plays one. That came out in court because when he was sued by his wife and for Sandy Hook later, guess what his lawyer had to say? He doesn't believe anything he does. And guess what? I would say for sure that guy works for some agency. Because guess yeah, what he yeah. does? Guess what he does? He puts all of nine people who actually have valid questions, valid reasons for thinking 9-11 was purported by external agents. But guess what? Because he now generalizes everybody as a whack job. Because people are going to say, yep, if he questions the government, they're a whack job. That was the point of Alex Jones. That's the point. Yeah, well, I'm glad that you're able to point people out who you believe is a shill and or an agent, whatever. I, I, I never, I, I, Eric, I'm, I'm quite careful in who I say is an agent. I understand. And I make uh, that. Maybe I can start being more careful, but I think to not talk about Alex it. Alex Jones is not a shill. He's not a shill. He's not he a shill. He wants you to believe he's a shill. Either, give me a break. I, look, I think what you need to do, Eric, is just be careful. Don't I will, rush the I will take heed to that and, um, you know. I just know that there's disinformation campaigns out there and many people I, I agree with you. I, I absolutely agree with you. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, hey, Adam, actually, I got something to say about fair and civil uh, 9-11 debates. They actually locked out the post that I made about yeah. tonight's show. Yeah, that but was Eric, really unfair. No, no, no. Well, actually, well, there's a rule is that every single post has to have a debate point. And he now usually so it actually has to be in the uh, but it was in the article itself. Right, so it needs to, it yeah, needs but to be he, actually on the post itself. Is that what you mean? That's correct. But but he gave you leniency as I'd never seen it before, because usually people post uh, website shows and whatnot. But he left yours up. He deleted it right away. But he left yours up. He just closed the commenting. That page specifically caters to debate. And every single post that's made there has to have a debate point. Hey, Adam, real quick, you know, just to show, I am trying to work on my being mellow about all that. In fact, when you unblocked me, you made a comment. I didn't respond back with anything. I just let it be. So 
why don't you unblock me and I can get a hold of what that one-on-one debate channel is. Hey, and, hey, uh, gentlemen, gentlemen, can we do this outside of um, the radio right. show? Hey, 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 I, well, I just told them to do that. I have to end the, the radio show right now because we're fine. past our time. Um, yep. gotta, yeah, but, Roly, gotta you're, him, yeah, Roly, you're, 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 paying, you're paying extra rent at this point. Yeah, actually, uh, there's people in the house that want to go to bed and they're kind of nudging yeah. at me. But this is a barn burner and I let it go on as long as I could because it is entertaining and very revealing and informative about what happened in the last like 34 minutes we've been in overdrive. But uh, <laughs> I got to call the shots and in the show now and we'll definitely do it again. And Sounds I'm good. always here Tuesday from 10 p.m. to midnight right here on revisionmedia.org. And next week I got... Um, I got a very special guest. I have Brandon Green with us next week. Um, he's going to talk to us about the May Day uh, March, and he's going to talk about a, pr- some protests he's been involved with in 5G. And uh, gentlemen, have a good night. All right. Uh, thank you, Bully. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Yep. Thanks, gentlemen. How to invent a religion. I always knew we had to be willing to die to even do this job. Can't stop that to come. Executive orders. The creation and the they maintenance of a secret government within our government. There's something wrong the what? with anything. You feel like you won't stand with your grip and face off. There's something wrong with anything. I was so spun. What's the most have you ever lost in the coin toss? The law of the jungle. The most you ever lost the coin toss. You don't know what you're talking about. Don't say it. Don't say it. You don't know what you're talking about. Oh. Suppression of unrest and dissent. Domestic anti-terrorism. I don't have some way to put it.